So glad you've chosen to worship with us today on this very first Sabbath of February, our Black History Month, and this is a very special Black History Sabbath with guest speaker, guest musicians, which will be introduced later. I also want to let you know that there is a study guide, a free study guide available for you in the Welcome Center in the lobby. It's entitled Social Justice in the Word of God. The brainchild behind this is Dr. Calvin Rock, former chairman of the LLUH board, and also Dr. Mervyn Warren, who was the former dean of religion at Oakland University. We encourage you to pick up a copy at the Welcome Center in the lobby. Now we've got a lot going on in this worship service, so we just have one more announcement, and that is the Winter Girl Awards. Want to make sure you put this on your calendar. February 19 at 4.30 right here in the sanctuary. We'll be giving more information in coming weeks, but put that on your calendar. It's always a very important Vespers program. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, go to our website, loc.org. And I just wanna wish you a wonderful and blessed Sabbath day.
Good morning, happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. We can do a little better than that. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord today. And we welcome you to Loma Linda University, this worship service on this beautiful day here in sunny Southern California. And today is a very special day here at our church. We celebrate black American history, and we're just excited that you can be a part of it. We give a special welcome to each of you here in person, as well as those of you who may be watching online, wherever you are in the world, we welcome you to our worship service today. I especially want to give a special welcome to our guests that we have with us today. First of all, I want to give a welcome to the Kansas Avenue Praise Team that you'll hear from shortly. We're excited about them being with us today. We thank you for being here, and we know you'll be blessed by their music today. We also want to give a welcome to Pastor Baron Savori. He will be speaking in the anthem um, worship service around 10.30 this morning. We want to give a special welcome to him. He's the senior pastor of the Valley Fellowship Church here in Rialto, California. And also want to give a special welcome to Brother um, David Anthony Johnson, a very talented young man who has a strong heart and passion for um, oration. And you'll hear from him a little later on as well. We thank you for you being here today, Brother David, and your family. And also I want to give a very special welcome today to our guest speaker. Our guest speaker today is a wonderful dear friend of mine. His name is Dr. Ron C. Smith. Ron is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and he's a product of Christian education. Ron completed his um, 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 bachelor's degree at Oakwood University in theology. Then he did his MDiv at Andrews. He did a Doctor of Ministry degree at Rochester Colgate University in Rochester, New York. And he also did his PhD in psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary right here in Pasadena. So we're truly glad to have you here with us today, Dr. Ron. Um, Ron has been um, married for 41 years to his beautiful Yolanda, who could not be with us today, but we know you're watching Yolanda there in Atlanta, so we send our love to you from Loma Linda University Church today. They have two adult children, and the, you know, the most important thing I can say about Dr. Ryan is that he has a heart for God, and he has a passion for seeing souls saved in the kingdom. He has served for the past 11 years as the president of the Southern Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Prior to that time, he served as um, a vice president of the uh, Review and Herald, and he was also the editor for Message Magazine. So he has a lot of experience, but his passion is for people. His passion is to see people saved in the kingdom of God. And we know that God's going to richly speak to our hearts today through him. At this time, I want to invite Pastor Randy to come up. He has a special announcement to make as he comes forth. It's good to have you, Pastor Randy. Good to see you this morning. Pastor Adrian, great to see and hear from you when you said this is a cold morning. I was talking with a couple right down here. I said, it's a cold morning. They said, it's not cold, it's cool. It's cool. We'll they take... said in Colorado just recently, it was 10 degrees below zero. Oh, my goodness. Heard that's, that's not even a righteous number, is it? No. <laughs> We're delighted you're here, especially on this Sabbath. I want to underline what Pastor Stu said in the announcements. At the Welcome Center in the lobby, we have available this study guide. And I want to say a couple of words about it. One of the enduring cries of Scripture is for us to come together, that they may be one, Jesus prayed, about his followers. Part of that is understanding those who may have had different experiences from our own. I want to encourage you to stop and get one of the study guides and spend some time with it. It may be very illuminating. For example, just right at the front, they have a various number of different did you knows. Did you know this? Did you know that Sojourner Truth, famous matron of the Underground Railroad, accepted Adventist teachings? Did you know that Uriah Smith wrote against slavery in the Adventist paper, the Review and Herald? Did you know that Ellen White told Adventist members, contrary to the law, not to return runaway slaves? Did you know that James White protested against slavery in the Adventist paper, The Review and Herald? I've been spending a lot of time in recent months, the last two or three years, reading Adventist history. And the more I've read, the more proud I've been of our heritage. This is a wonderful way to get in touch with that, to understand one another across what has been a great divide. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of that this month and take advantage of the opportunity to pray along with Jesus 
that we might be one. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Pastor, Pastor Randy. Randy. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome, welcome to worship. speaks for God saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will hear their prayer and will heal their land. We're called to come before God in prayer, to come with our praise, to come with our gratitude, with our petitions, but also with our repentance and turning to Him. 
I suspect that especially in days like these, you may have come with a heavy burden on your heart, a burden for yourself, a burden for someone in your family, a burden for our land, our country, our church. We want to invite you to come down to the front in a moment the praise team will sing and we want to invite you to just move into the aisles to come down to the front. If you have a special burden you would like to bring before God today in prayer, we would like to join you in prayer for that. So would you just come as the praise team sings. like to invite the rest of you as you're able to do so to kneel as we pray. Gracious God, it stirs my heart to see brothers and sisters in Christ, members and guests to this community, friends of mine personally over many years, come to the front. Come may be weighed down and burdened, burdened by what they face, by the uncertainty of life, by the difficulties which challenge us today. Or there are many in our community who are broken, broken by grief, by sorrow, by impending loss, people we love and care about. There are many others who struggle, to whom life has been very hard and deeply unfair. We pray for them. We pray that we might be compelled to reach out beyond our borders of comfort, beyond our cocoons, to do the work of Jesus in the world. Lord, we come with these kinds of requests because you have invited us to do so. We come with those words ringing in, my, in our ears, if my people will pray. Lord, we're praying. We're praying and presenting our petitions and our gratitude to you today. I want to give just a bit of time and silence without my voice to allow those who have come and have knelt with special burdens to present those to you at this time. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Come with your peace and your power. Come in your own gentle way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Good morning, church. A few months ago, as I was working here, a phone call came through. Someone just wanted to talk to a pastor. I was available. And let me just let you know, if any of you ever just want to talk to a pastor, just call us up. You absolutely can. On the phone that day was a young lady, and she had been through some struggles. We talked for a while, and there were some points of pain in her life. We just listened. We prayed. After a while, her boyfriend wanted to know who was on the phone. So she said it was a pastor. And he got really excited. <laughs> and so he said, I want to talk to him too. I was like, OK. <laughs> so, so we had a chat as well. It was really beautiful. There was this moment in the conversation. He said, you know what? I know God is real. I said, OK, well, tell me how. He said, listen, about five years ago, so I was walking down the road. I saw somebody on the side of the road, and oh, I just pulled out the $20 note that I had in my wallet and gave it to them. When it came to lunch, I realized that that was the only money I had. <laughs> and as I sat there, I, I had nothing left. And I was so disappointed, I sat down at a bus stop. And there was a brand new crisp $20 note. <laughs> and he said, I know God is real because I know God cared for me because I gave. And ever since then, I just know I can just take care of the people around me. And <laughs> it was a beautiful story. And I must admit, I don't think his theology is all that bad. <laughs> The book of Proverbs 19, there it says, To those who give to the ones who are in need, they give as to the Lord. And the Lord will repay them for what they give. I like that story because the young man didn't receive more than he gave. He didn't suddenly become a millionaire. No, he just he received what he had given. And he went on to tell me all the ways in which he felt he wasn't living right and I thought he was doing okay. But the truth is he lived a life of generosity because he believed God was with him. We here at the Loma Linda University Church, we believe that we can be generous. We believe we can be as generous as we wish because there is no way that our generosity can outstrip God's provision for us. And so we give, we do. We give to our educational institutions. We give in the manner of healthcare. We give in the way in which we teach grace and peace and invite people to a church so they can learn to worship God. If you want to join us in that purpose of giving, let me say we would just be grateful and we know that God will be with you. Thank you for thinking about your tithes and offerings as the deacons come forward.
Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Our passage in scripture this morning was chosen by, by our speaker, Dr. Smith. It's very short, but very powerful. Listen closely to the words. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. On August 28, 1963, God called a native son of the Deep South to address a crowd who had descended upon the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to plead for economic and political justice at an event called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That year commemorated the 100th anniversary of the historic Emancipation Proclamation. The day prior to the event, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. labored through the night and produced a speech he hoped would persuade government leaders and the public to take action against economic and racial injustice in America. This event would serve as Dr. King's debut on the national stage and give the civil rights movement broad media coverage. Against the backdrop of the Lincoln Memorial, amid its majestic columns, Dr. King came to the podium. With a quarter of a million in attendance and millions more listening by TV and radio, Dr. King began to address the crowd. Halfway into his speech, his friend, legendary gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, yelled to him from the sideline saying, tell them about the dream. Dr. King had shared his dream at other speaking engagements, but he had no intention of speaking about the dream that day. The man who believed the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, whose ears are open to their cry, put his notes aside. He was overshadowed by the spirit that moved in the movement. Laced with historical, literary, and biblical references, Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech in a soul-stirring voice. And after 60 years, the dream still lives. I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners one day be able to sit down together at the table of justice. I have a dream. One day, the state of Mississippi, sweltering with the heat of oppression, sweltering with the heat of an ocean, one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day my four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor 
having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls one day be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that every valley will be exalted. Every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation to a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when we can sing with new meaning. My country, it is of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America's to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the Highland Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. Not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. God bless you.
I give an honor to God today, the author and finisher of my faith, extended to me with the privilege of standing before you, the Loma Linda Church community, surrounding this Sabbath that has been designated as Black History Sabbath. If you're anticipating that I would preach a chronicling of black histor historical events, uh, that is really not my intention this morning. I do want to say that I'm very cognizant of the journeys of so many of my brothers and my sisters, as has been talked about and sung about this morning. But as an African-American brother who loves Jesus, I'm proud to be a son of God, to be a Christian with Christ as the center of my faith. It seems most appropriate to be in concert with the theme established today, I want to preach on the subject, unshackled. There is a statement as found in the gospel according to St. Mark. But before I read Mark, I want to share our statement that's our scripture lesson for today that was read so beautifully, John 8:36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. That text gets best operationalized and demonstrated through the gospel according to St. Mark. There is a statement in Mark, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1, and I'll read onward just a bit. It declares, and they came over to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him. No, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. 
I'm hastening to verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid, unshackled. In this, the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, as well as John 8.36, I find what must be two of the most interesting passages that are related in the entire Word of God. Not another chapter like it in the Bible. For in chapter 5 of Mark, particularly, Mark conveys what it's like to be trapped what it's like to be shackled and bound by circumstances that you cannot contain nor manage. But he also talks about, in the very same chapter, the liberating and the emancipating power of Jesus Christ. So thus, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we who are endeavoring to follow in the footprints of the God-man, Jesus Christ. We find ourselves living in very hostile environments. Would you agree? In a very perilous period of history, not just because of COVID, but we're living in an age of crises, conflicts, and confrontations. We're living in an age where goodness has been gored by the bull of iniquity. We're living in an age where holiness is hated. Truth has been trampled underneath the insensitive feet of men and women. In an age where Christ is cheerfully crucified, his presence is not welcome nor is it wanted. I've got to add though, this is not peculiar nor unique to the 21st century Christian. For if I read my Bible right, and understand it correctly, Christ has always been hated. He's always been alienated or ostracized and excommunicated from society. Such is the case in this story we've just read of these demoniacs, these demon-possessed people, this demon-possessed man in Gadara. Picture it in your mind's eye, if you will. Jesus has been teaching and preaching by the seaside and now being mentally and physically and emotionally exhausted, he beseeches his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. Let me suggest figuratively to you as we sit at this position in history, as we look back and as we look forward, I wanna to say to you, I wanna to say to myself afresh, let's cross over to the other side, meaning what? Let's cross over to truth. Let's cross over to a higher level of commitment to diversity and cultural competence. Let's cross over to a higher level of piety and an enriched relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's cross over to the other side. Well, there to meet him on the other side was a strange set of circumstances. The land of Gadara was considered to be Gentile territory, heavily influenced by the Hellenistic culture, non-Jews, if you please. You see, they knew more about Zeus than they knew of Jehovah. They knew more about the, philical, the philosophical patterns of Plato than they knew of the moral mandates of Moses. But despite this culture, Christ went on anyhow. Why? Because his divine antenna picked up a distress signal. Somebody was in need. Somebody oppressed was calling upon the name of Jesus. There to meet him was a man whose dilemma was serious. He was disowned by his people. He was living in a cemetery and not the least of his problems, he was possessed with demons. Here he is. I've endeavored to look at this man over and over again. His peer group condemns him. He's forced to live in a graveyard 
and he's possessed with demons. The tragedy is I understand that graveyards are designed for dead folks and not the living. But his home is a tomb. His companions are the skeletal fragments of those who sleep in the dust. Somebody has said this man was not only emotionally emulsified and mentally mortified, but he was also spiritually strangulized. He was dead, a spiritually dead demoniac. And it highlights the fact, my brothers and my sisters, that either we're going to be directed by God or driven by the devil. Either we're going to be influenced by Jesus or infested by the devil. Either we're going to be sanctified by a Holy Spirit or desecrated by an evil spirit. There is no middle ground of neutrality. There is no straddling the fence when it comes to spiritual things. I wonder though, what is it that caused this man to live in such a condition like many of us? Maybe he just couldn't cope with the problems that he faced. Or maybe he just couldn't bear his burdens in the heat of the day. Or perhaps he just couldn't stand up under the pressures, the pressures of staying in school, the pressures of finding suitable employment, the pressures of being a social outcast in society, the pressures of seeing the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, or perhaps his sins pushed him further and further to a point of no extrication. I really don't know what the issues were, but Ellen White, my favorite author, she makes an observation. She says, this man was leading a normal life like many of us, but one day he took a step and the devil took control of his mind. Somebody has said, the world could see the, uh, the scars on the outside of this man, but nobody could really see the wounds on the inside. Here he is, he lives in a cemetery. Let me suggest something. Spiritually, whenever a person turns his or her back on God, intelligently doing so, there's but one place for that person to live. And that's in the tombs of iniquity. Hear me? It matters not how intelligent we might think we are. We may have been on the dean's list every semester in university. It doesn't matter how many degrees you've got behind your name. But without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. Your home might look like the Taj Mahal, but without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. You may dress in all the finest of garments and all the designer labels, but without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. There's but one place for a person who retreats from God and reality, and that's in the tombs of iniquity or the tombstones of irrationality. Mark says this man was was so disgusted with himself, he was so miserable with himself, that he would howl and he would moan. He was restless. Sort of reminds me of what Isaiah said. He said, the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Well, where I live, maybe not where you live. Friday nights, the clubs are packed. I live from in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm originally from New York City. Running from man to man, from woman to woman, sucking on the bottle, popping a pill, trying to get high, trying to feel better, trying to get some peace. What a message we have to share with our, with our culture, with our world, with our surrounding communities. That peace doesn't come in a bottle, but it comes in the body of Christ. Peace doesn't come in a pill, but it comes in a savior or in a person. Peace doesn't come in sex, but it comes in a savior, and his name is Jesus. Mark says this man, I imagine they hadn't buried anyone in that part of the cemetery for quite a long while. Anyone who walked by automatically quickened their footsteps. Must have been some mischievous young people who would taunt that crazy man in the tombs and hurl rocks at him and call him names. And every now and then I'd hear the sound of, al of alarm that would be, that would be raised as, as the man would break those leather straps and iron chains and bust out of that cemetery. It's kind of how sin is. We break loose. I could hear the sound of alarm that would be given as strong men in masses would pounce upon that man, bind him again with leather straps and iron chains and throw him back into the cemetery. That's how sin is. 
It traps us. Mark goes on to say, this man was so miserable, he would take sharp rocks and he would lacerate his flesh. He would pull his hair out by the roots. He would howl and he would moan all night long. Early in the morning, you could hear him whimpering softly. Late at night, you could hear him crying loudly. He's hurting himself. It kind of reminds me of culture and society. There are a lot of people I pass on the way to church who are hurting themselves. You don't believe me? Ask. Ask the young man in the inner city who's overdosed with a crack pipe or a needle stuck in his arm. If he's clear, he will tell you that he's only succeeded in hurting himself. Ask the man whose liver is bloated, whose heart is failing because of alcohol. If he's clear, he will tell you that he's only succeeded in hurting himself. Ask the woman who walks the streets by night selling her wares in order to feed her children. If she's clear and honest, she will tell you at the end of the day she's only succeeded in hurting herself. Ask the man, ask the woman who may have quietly delved into immorality. Nobody knows but them and God. If they're honest, they will tell you at the end of the day, after all the fun was over, that they've only succeeded in hurting themselves. Or what is this man that we read about really asking? As he cries, as he howls, as he moans, as he lacerates his flesh, what is he really asking? He's asking culture. Does anybody care? Is anybody interested in me? Does anybody care about what I think about where I go, what I process? Does anybody care? And you know something? I was reading something recently. Teenage suicide is at an all-time high. More young people in the year 2021 took their lives than, uh, more than, than ever before in the history of this nation. I don't know if that was due to COVID or what, but they took their lives in protest, wondering, does anybody care? And to the church, this is a beautiful, beautiful structure. I'm not talking about the brick and the mortar, but I'm talking about you and me. We've got to give an answer. We've got to go out where the rubber meets the road. We've got to find that junkie, that druggie, and offer him a new high in Jesus Christ. We've got to find that drunk and offer him a drink that won't make him drunk. But he'll be drinking from the crystal fountain that shall never run dry. What is this man really asking? Does anybody care? I can see Jesus now as he's making his way across the boat. That divine antenna heard him. Yes, there's somebody who cares about you. Jesus is his name. Help is on the way. And then my favorite author writes something in Desire of Ages. You know, as Jesus got out of that boat and set foot on that Gadarene shore, it was still dusk, a little dark. You know, uh, it is said that darkness has a way of making familiar places look strange. For out of the elongated shadows of night, suddenly this eerie form appears, and he lets loose with a shriek that seemed to come from the very pits of hell itself. As they look at this man, the disciples, as they glance at him along with Jesus, he's stark naked. He's foaming at the mouth. His eyes look like two coals of fire from the burning hell itself. He's screaming and hollering. He's jumping up and down. And the disciples take one look at him. And their blood runs cold and curdles within their veins. And they leave Jesus standing there all by himself. Oh, church of the living God, how easily we forget how Jesus has helped us in our last crises. Why? Mark 4, just coming over the lake, you know the story, the night before, the winds and the waves had become a little unruly, and the lightning had begun to write a flaming message of descent in the sky, and the thunder was muttering in protest against the eastern horizon, and everybody on board was afraid. Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know the story. Jesus stood up in the boat and told the winds to shut up and the waves to be still. Well, that same hand that calmed the storm. The same hand that quieted the elements, the same hand that stemmed the tide, was held up against these raging 2,000 demons in this one man. And, the, and Ellen White makes a statement. She says, all the demons of hell in that man, they were raging, but they were helpless. They were helpless. I see Jesus as he faces those demoniacs, and they look at him. You see, these demons, they had a sense of recall. They realize that they've been whipped before. Now, let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand. That means it's rhetorical. Have you ever been beaten up before? 
Don't answer. Don't answer. Don't raise your hand. Don't even grunt. I'll, I'll tell you about me. I have. I was sitting in middle school, and there was a little Asian fella sitting next to me. I was a little athlete. I tried to play a little ball, and you know, I, got me, I had me a few little awards and that kind of thing. I had a few muscles back then. You may not believe me, but I did. <laughs> and I just didn't like this little Asian fella sitting next to me. His hair was a little straighter than mine. He had some slanted eyes. He got A's on his exam. I got D's on mine. Don't, don't pay attention to that PhD that they said I had. I got D's on my, on, my, on my exams. I did not like him. So I took my pencil eraser and I began to poke him in his side. And he says, ouch, that hurts. Please stop. And I said, I'm a little fellow from the hood. I said, no, I don't want to stop. I kept poking him in his side. Teacher writing on the board. He stopped writing and turned around. He said, Ronald, keep your hands to yourself and leave Choi alone. Well, as soon as he turned his back again to write on the board, I started poking him again with my pencil eraser. And Choi looked at me and he says, let's be friends. I said, I don't want to be friends. I kept poking. He says, then he gave a plaintive wail. He says, I don't want to fight. I said, I want to fight. Well, the bell tolled. It was 3.30. It was time to go home. And there was a flagpole in the middle of the courtyard. And there was always a special feature at the, at the flagpole every day. Well, Choi and I were the special feature for that day. Now, this is before text messaging. This is before social media. I don't know how in the world the word got around, but the place was packed. It was like the WWF. Everybody came out to see the feature. And I'm pushing Choi, and Choi's Choi trying to get away, and I'm moving after him. He's saying, hey, stop. I said, come on, man, put him up. And I lunged at him. And the last thing I remember, I saw something like this. Ha! Ah! <laughs> and he kicked me down to the concrete, and my head hit the cold ground. And I looked up, and the heavens opened. And I saw the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and all the heavenly constellations. So I couldn't go down like that. So I jumped up with newfound strength and I lunged at him again. And again, he says, oh, he says something like this. <laughs> and he kicked me back down to the earth again. And then, Brother David, then I began to pray. Guess what my prayer was? Lord, please end this fight. <laughs> Come on, folks, don't laugh. You know that's a decent prayer. That's a wonderful prayer. When you're in trouble, you can pray. I started it. I made it. I made a mess, but I prayed the Lord get me out of it. Well, um, but then my prayer twisted, kind of got a little jiggy. I said, Lord, just like you were with David, the shepherd boy, when he killed the lion with his bare hands, Lord, just like you were with Samson, when he killed 10,000 Philistines. Be with me this last time, dear Jesus, as I take this Asian out in your name. What an ignorant prayer. Aren't you glad God doesn't answer every prayer we pray the way we pray it? Well, I, I got up then with newfound strength. I knew the story of Samson. And this time he was twirling around like a top. His hair was all over his head. And he was making little sounds like a guy I once knew named Bruce Lee. And he was saying, hola, 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 hola. and he was spinning around like a top. And I lunged at him again, and he kicked me in the head and kicked me down to the concrete. My head hit the flagpole and hit the ground. I saw some of the most beautiful colors. <laughs> and then I lay there, and I had blood pouring out of my nose and my mouth. And I said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> and then he leaned down. He took his little, his little handkerchief, he leaned down, he says, are you okay? <laughs> and he picked me up and walked me back to the washroom, wiped all the blood from my collar, and of course, I was hoping that the people would be gone, but they were still there waiting. So as we were walking out, I put my arm around him like we were best friends. I said, man, let's be friends. <laughs> this demon in human form, these demons in human form, they looked at this Jesus and they said, this is the same being who kicked us out of heaven in the first place. They had a sense of recall. 
And if demons recognize who Jesus is, then everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Years later, I met this very same gentleman. You know, I suffered a stroke 22 years ago. I was crippled. And then there was a doctor who came in. He had Choi written on his, on, his, on his coat. And he says, hey, Ron, remember me? I didn't want to let him know that I remembered. I said, somehow I just don't have a recall. They said, cut it out, Ron. He says, do you still have that left hook? And I said, no, Doc Choi, I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. And basically, he's my friend this day. I had a sense of recall. Those demons, they recognize that this is the same being who kicked us out of heaven. They recognize who Jesus, come out of the man. Thou one clean spirit. And 2,000 demons came out, of that, came out of that one man, and they ran into some pigs, and they all committed suicide. That affected the economy. That was another way of saying the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached an all-time low. Or the NASDAQ fell. And those that fed the swine, those who watched the economy, they came out to see what it was, the Bible says, that was done. But what did they see? They saw a man sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Master, can I go back with you? There he sits with the docility of a little child. There he sits with the innocence of a little baby. Jesus, let me go back with, with you. Jesus says, no, sir. Here's what I want you to do, sir. I, I need you to stay here, go back to your community, go back to your city, and I want you to tell the men and women the great things I've done for you. Can you see him? As he's escorted down the dusty roads of the Decapolis, people are asking him, sir, what happened to you? Weren't you once that man living in a graveyard? You were deranged. What happened? I guess he's somewhat befuddled with excitement and enthusiasm. Well, yeah, I was that guy. What happened? Well, I can't explain it. All I know is I met a man named Jesus. What does that mean? I gave him my sorrows. And he gave me his joys. I gave him my nightmares. And he gave me his dreams. I gave him my life, and he made me a brand new creature. All I can say is that I'm free. The question I would ask you surrounding this freedom motif and this unshackling experience that you can enjoy, would you be free? Would you be unshackled from your burdens of sin and difficulty? Guess what? There's power in the blood of Jesus. How do I know? They placed him in a tomb. They put guards on the outside and a stone at the door, but he kicked free. And because he's free, I'm free. And because he's loose, I'm unshackled. Because he's got power, I've got power. Power over depression, power over feelings of discrimination, power over hurt, power over separation anxiety power over difficulties of life. I wish I had money to give you. I'm so happy to be here, but I don't. How do they say it? I'm so broke I can't pay attention. But there's one thing I can give you on this Freedom Sabbath. I can give you Jesus. What is he? Is he just a neurologist when you had a stroke like I did 22 years ago when the doctor said you wouldn't walk again? What is he? Is he just a cardiologist if you've got a bad heart? What is Jesus after all? Is he just an oncologist if you've got cancer? What is he? Is he just a good passenger if you've got a sinking boat? Is he just a grocer if you've got some hungry folk? Is he just a physician if you don't feel well? You know, I'm glad he's all of that. But thank God he's more. When you don't have a job, he's the best employment agent in the universe. When you have no self-esteem left, you've messed up and you can't show your face anymore. You know what? He's a robe to cover your shame. He's Adam's redeemed. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's hope. He's Jeremiah's bones of fire. He's Amos's justice. He's Hosea's love. He's Micah's mercy. He's Esther's determination. He's my bread when I'm hungry. 
He's my water when I'm thirsty. When I get down to my last dime, he steps right in on time. Somebody has said, he's my sacrifice. He's my priest, pleading for my atonement. He's my Shekinah that lights the dark way. He's the veil through which I reach God. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Savior for any sinner who wants salvation. He's intercessor supreme. He's mediator, redeemer, restorer. He's the only one who can unshackle you from your pain. Father, I pray deliverance and unshackling for your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. We want to thank you, Dr. Smith, for inspiring us today in this wonderful, timely message. Our hearts have been inspired to know that whatever we are dealing with in our lives, we can truly be unshackled today. If that's your desire, let me see you just wave your hands around this congregation. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being with us on this blessed day and thank you for the message that we've just heard and I'm sure that it resonates in each person's heart who may be listening, who are in this congregation, whoever they are in the world, just as it has in mind. And so I rededicate my life to you right now. And I'm sure those who are watching and listening are determined to do the same thing, Father. We ask that you would just have your way in our lives and continue to lead us and guide us and help us to be people of compassion to someone else that we may come across who needs someone to just uplift them, to encourage them, and to inspire them. This is our prayer in the blessed name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.
Creating lives, blessing nations, Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath to all of you out there. Sheila and I here together. We're going to give you a quick tour of our new facility, but we're standing here in a special place. Uh, uh, Sheila, what we're standing in front of right now? Well, we're excited to show this whole place to you. We're standing in front of the studio that we've been working in for 15 years. It's had a lot of different renovations, but um, we're just right in, would you say in front? Yeah. We're on the side of it, sort of like. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like on the side. Wonderful. And, and just on the precipice of the new exciting building that you have blessed us with your gifts, that um, with God's help, this has been created. Amen. Amen. So we're going to show you this, pro this project as a testimony of what God has done here for LLVN. But before we go any further, we're going to have verse of the day. Sheila, you have it? I do. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's correct, Sheila. Uh, that was a great verse. As a matter of fact, this verse reflects the very essence of topics were discussed into Christian connections that we recorded last week. Your last chance to tune into it this evening at the scheduled time you see at the bottom of the screen. You know, faith is what built LLVN. Faith is what brought us all together here, Sheila. Faith, what helped us develop this place behind us, because we never had the money when we bought the property. Mm -hmm. We borrowed and we fixed it, we paid it off, and we've been debt free since. And it was faith that we stepped out in to build this building in, because we thought we had all the money to start, but soon before the beginning, we realized that money was not going to cover all expenses because of COVID-19 increased cost of material that jumped up to by 30, 40 percent, in some cases 100 percent. So we knew by faith we have to continue. And through faith, God helped LLVN have a new facility here for His Amen. own glory. Yes, that's so exciting. I'm excited to show it to our viewers. Yeah, you know, we all are because they're the ones who deserve to see it. Since yes. They, you were our partner throughout the whole process. And you helped to shape our faith by your support and your involvement with us because it made us know that there are partners like you out there who believe in what we're doing. Well, uh, we have sponsors today for the live broadcast. I mean, we, we have sponsors all throughout the week. But we always try to pick up, focus on the four who we pick for the live broadcast. So who do you have for us? We have the Fandel family from Maryland, the Wichinich family from California, the Bone family from Oregon, and the Trey family from Georgia. I hope I didn't mess up your names, but please forgive me. And you could write in and let me know um, how to pronounce it next time. And special thanks to all of you folks, those who Sheila just mentioned, and yes. all of you who are sponsoring us throughout the week 24-7. Well, we do want to invite you to go to our website. There is continued growth on our website. Uh, uh, we just added the uh, uh, Romanian channel archives. It's kind of getting started there. So now there's nine channels on our website that you can get access to, although the Romanian channel is still under development, but now you can get a sneak preview mm -hmm. of what we have there. It's really exciting what Jesus is leading us with this ministry. So go to our website, LLBN.tv. Download your phone app. If you have Apple or Android, they can go what? To the, to the App Store? They can. And just um, download LLBN TV. Yeah. No, not even TV. Just, just LLBN. LLBN. Okay. Yeah, Four letters. Right. All you and have to has a dove, in. a white dove. That's it's really right. great. And, and, and you can enjoy LLBN nine channels from wherever you're at. You can be driving and listening, mm -hmm. or you could be at home watching, or you could be at the office listening as well. So That's right. And God, I just told my sister just to download it. She kept you. asking me, what channel is that? I go, just get the app. You can see it on your phone. You know, everyone so. I meet, I introduce my name and say, do me a favor, go to your phone, download the app, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll continue the conversation. And I'm, you'd be surprised how many friends I build. This is how we expand the ministry, by you telling friends, and a friend tells yes. another friend. It's yes. really exciting, isn't it's, it? It's great because wherever you are, you can watch it. You can have church wherever you go. I mean, I believe it's not just one day that you talk to God. It's 
we live and he, he has our being, you know? Right. So it's like we breathe it. And the more we do that, it just becomes more of who we are. Amen, amen. Well, why don't we pause here and have you read some of our lucky letter writings. Okay, oh, sounds writers. good, sounds good. We have letters from Dan from Seattle, Washington, who writes, thank you all for what you do. LLBN is such a blessing. And Monica from Grand Terrace, California says, I'm 85 and I love the Sabbath church service each Friday night. It's a blessing to have church on TV. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Monica. Should we pray for them now? Absolutely. Go ahead. Dan um, and Monica, dear God, we just present them to you. We lift them up in prayer. We thank you so much for their dedication and their love and prayers and the support for LBN. It's it's through the love of, and support of all our viewers that this is done. But most especially, it's because you bless us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God. And um, we ask you to continue to be with us and especially be with our viewers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So from locally at Grand Terrace to Washington to around the world, if you're watching, praise God. He has helped us build this new facility we started from cleaning up dirt, mm -hmm. paving the ground, and to where it's at now, right now. It is all for His glory, and we're going to give you a quick tour of what we have to show you today. Should we do it? Yes, let's go. Well, we just changed position, and I'm going to quiz Sheila, see how she would, de how she would describe what we're standing. Well, I would call this the hub that connects to everything. Like we have the old studio, and we have all the new things that we are going to explore together. So, Ganem, you could tell more about that. I'm impressed, <laughs> and it connects us to the upstairs wing, uh, south and north wings. Uh, this is truly the hub, the center connection, tying new and old and upstairs resources all in one. But we're going to take you right now to one of our video control rooms. So why don't we take you and show you what we have there? Well, now we've taken you in a very, very important room of our operation. And let's see if Sheila knows what this room is. Well, I just can see it says we are in some type of control room, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. You're absolutely right. You mean, you, you're a broadcaster now. You, you seem to... Well, this is very high tech. I'm very, you know, I'm learning as our viewers. I'm learning with you viewers. So. Well, that, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. We're all growing together. This room is not completely furnished with all the complex electronics yet. But as you see, the room is ready, the monitor's hung, there's other layer of monitors, cables will be hidden, and there's equipment cabinets directly across mm -hmm. from us that will be populated with very high-cost broadcast equipment. Uh, but this room, essentially, can direct programs from any of our six different studio locations. So it's a very, very essential room to our operation. But it's kind of like the brains of Yeah, everything. it's like central mm -hmm. command center, for mm -hmm. lack of better words. But we have other technology room are equally important to this room. We're going to take you there next. So this is one of the other rooms. We clearly cannot show every room because several of them are just still empty. But Sheila, since you know so much about our development, what is this room? Well, this is the data processing room. So it's really exciting, Dean Ganem. I can't tell you. I'm really excited about looking at all of this and just seeing the fruition from literally dirt to this wonderful building. See what God can do. So amazing. It's amazing, which is why you want to tune in to Christian Connections this evening because it talks about faith. It's a great program. And this whole building, again, built by faith. We have Jessica Paley here. You want to say, wave your hands to the cameras. Hi, Jessica. Uh, <laughs> this room has been tested with the computer terminals surrounding the room and that's where we do all the data processing for information uh, and uh, it's a very critical component of our day-to-day uh, -day operation but let's continue on to show Sounds other parts good. of the other parts of the um, our organization so I'm stepping here in this room Sheila why don't you come and join me here in this room and let's face the camera and folks, this is another very critical room of our operation. There are two like it, but slightly different in, in, in shape and, and type of equipment. But here to my left, there are special electronic equipment rack where we would house very complex broadcast pieces of equipment as well here as we did in the other room. 
But this room has a very special function. We call it Master Control One. Sheila can explain to you what this room is purpose for. Well, basically, if there's something that goes wrong internationally with the feed, mm -hmm. this is the room that can help and control that. And they'll know right away if something breaks the feed. Precisely. Okay. Precisely. That's an excellent description. So we have worldwide distributions going through thousands of hubs across the world. And as Sheila said, if any of them go out of service or fail to operate, our staff here will be able to tell that it went down in real time so they can make the proper calls to restore the service. And there will be more monitors, of course, installed on the wall. This is just in its preliminary phase of housing it with equipment. But there's more. We're going to take them upstairs and give them a tour. Are you up to it? Sounds good. So we're here in the middle in a very, very important room. And what is it called? The master video control room number two. That's correct, number two. So this room has a many, many purposes. It's truly a multi-purpose room. More monitors going on the walls, three layers of small monitors all the way across. Cabinets here with equipment will be housed with very complex technologies to do what? To be able to pull in international feeds and productions from around the world. This room will be able to do five to six mo uh, uh, simultaneous live productions, either from locally or internationally or combined of all that. And this room also where we can do all the live switching between program to program. As you see on Sabbath when University Church airs, we switch back between week review and we put a little music and fillers between. That requires special switching and operation. This room will do that as well. Important room, keep it in mind. In the future, you'll see the result and the work of this room coming your way. Let's go move on to show them the rest. Wow, this is about two-thirds the space of what we just toured. That's correct, that's correct. So this is all drywalled, uh, uh, cleaned, ready to go, electrical distributed throughout the, this place. It's place for growth. Uh, we have other plans, but, you know, we have to make... We had to stop part of this construction to work with the money we had. Uh, this is where we look up to you, our dear partners, to help build this house of worship. It's a virtual house of worship that reaches the entire world with the word of God. So uh, uh, amazing what God has done for us, mm. Sheila. We have suffered during the building. We were hit by COVID. Uh, there's shortage in supply, equipment, and uh, supplies cost more than some cases doubled. Uh, it was hard work, hard labor, but look what we did. It's for the glory of our God. Amen. And your help and support made it possible, but much more needed. Last word, Sheila. That's right. It, it's all the gifts and the prayers that you have contributed. We're all together in this and all praise and glory to God. We want to be and continue to be LLBN, which is Lighting Lives, Blessing Nations. Amen, and may God bless you richly. And please do not forget your prayers for LLVN. We are viewer-supported number. God bless you. Amen. God bless. Happy Sabbath. 
We are so glad that you have chosen to join us today for this Sabbath School discussion. We enjoy discussing together, but we also enjoy hearing from you. And so if you have an opportunity to send us an email or to give a phone call to the church, we'd love to hear from you because this is a discussion that we all learn from. If you are, if you have been joining us over the past few weeks, you know that we've been discussing the book of Hebrews. And this beautiful book connects the message of the Old Testament with the New in a really poetic way. So we're so glad that you've been a part of this discussion and um, are looking forward to, to the, the discussion continuing today. We, we will be looking at the book of Hebrews chapters 5 and 7 today, where the writer of Hebrews describes how Jesus is greater than the Old Testament um, priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. And really the theme of the book of Hebrews in general is that Jesus is greater than everything that preceded him before that. And so what does that mean for us? What does that mean that Jesus is greater than the priesthood and that we are also a part of in that line of Jesus's priesthood? But before we get into that, I'd like to invite our um, my partner in this discussion, Pastor Philip here with us. Hey, Joey. Hello, everyone. Pastor Philip is our young adult pastor, and he does an incredible ministry with Praxis, our young adult ministry. And he's here to help us understand this Levitical priesthood. But before we get into that, before we dive into the passage, let's have a word of prayer together. Good and gracious God, we want to thank you so much for being a God who is so much greater than we could possibly imagine. You showed so much beauty about yourself through the experiences throughout the Old Testament. And then you came in person to, to show us even more about who you are like. And so as we read through the book of Hebrews, help us to understand you even more clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Joy, I'm looking forward to this. This is quite the, the lesson this week. I know. It's wow. A, it, it's a lot. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, the priesthood is not something that we think about typically right, now because right, right. we don't have a priesthood. Right. 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 Um, but sometimes we think of pastors as priests. Sure. Some people have made that connection sure. when in reality, we're all priests. Right. right? Paul, Paul gives that clarity. Hey, the priesthood of all believers. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know some communities in our Catholic uh, community, they, they absolutely understand that tie much more uh, to being their their main shepherd is called a priest and functions in some unique ways like the old testament priest did uh, whereas the protestant community has pastors ministers bishops you know in some communities they call it so it is a foreign term to us oh. yeah. yeah yeah so then why don't we start by talking about a little bit what the role of an Old Testament Levitical priest was. Yeah, yeah. So what 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 are some things that the what was the role that that high priest and and the priesthood in general were supposed to play for the yeah, community? Yeah, of that's Israel? a that's a great place to start. And I think um, the author of Hebrews, I, I believe it was Paul, gives us that clarity right in the very first few verses. And so if we look at that, he gives us an outline. What is the role of a priest? And so beginning in verse one, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to, catch this, represent the people in matters related to God, particularly to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of other people. So here we catch, at least in my view, three different unique things that made a priest in that time. So this priest was A, a go-between, mm -hmm. God and others. Yeah. Secondly, his function was to provide the sacrifice as a merit beckoned unto these people as a correction for their sin. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, they were also a priest and that was not perfect, but was subject to their own infirmities as a human being. Mm -hmm. So they had weaknesses, they had sins of their own. So they would have to first confess their own sin before they could do that for others. Yeah. That's what I saw. Yeah, so, so definitely that, that aspect of a go-between, this, mm -hmm. this mediator is the word that we often use, yeah. that they are connected with 
with humanity and also connected with God, and they mm. almost act like a bridge between the yes, two. Yes, yes. You know? yeah. And well, there's one other aspect I realized we didn't say is in that they were chosen mm. from among the people. God looked at, at Moses and said, hey, set aside your brother Aaron and yeah. all of his sons. And then it kind of went through that lineage and it was passed down one to the other to the other as being the high priest. So it wasn't something that one could just arbitrarily say, hey, I'm going to be the priest for everyone, okay? Mm -hmm. Just want everyone to understand that. <laughs> you know, it was like God appointed this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they act, number one, as a mediator and then as someone who mediates the sacrifice yes. to reconcile humanity with God. Right. And then that they also had to sacrifice for themselves right. because they were also broken people. Right. And then they were chosen by God. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. This, this is what the priesthood yeah. looked like. And, you know, it's interesting. They were also limited mm -hmm. specifically. I mean, they didn't inherit any of the land in the promised land. Mm -hmm. They were limited to, you could say, acquiring great wealth, acquiring yeah. many flocks and all these, you know, they had some of these things, but they were also placed into a, a confines of sorts yeah. because of their role. So being a priest wasn't a, an easy thing, uh, but B, it was also a very special honor that was yeah. bestowed unto them. And as a result of that, the tithes, we're given we'll get that comes into a little bit in chapter six and then also some of the the blessing from the sacrifices they were received as a result of the fact they didn't have means as others did yeah so they were they were kind of unusual in that they were a part of the community mm -hmm. but they were also a little bit separate yeah, from the were. rest of the community yeah, as well yeah. that that theme of in but not of right that jesus talks right. about for his followers right. Right. You know, and, and this is an interesting thing a bit when we talk about it in our day and time right now, because sometimes people will confuse when I've, I've been in situations where, and maybe this is one of you looking at me and you're like, I've done this. You know, you're with the pastor and all of a sudden, you know, they, they uh, don't assume you eat something or you do something or you said something and they're like, pastor i didn't know that you you know it's like what well, you're held to a higher standard you know and to some degree i understand that but there's this removal of themselves from mm. that standard as well it's like well i don't have to uphold that so yeah. it's a shock that you would do that yeah. oh my word you know yeah. uh, so that's always kind of a funny thing to me but yeah. there there is a sense of they uphold and are an example and they um are, are called to live in the ideal. But the text here points out they too suffered with weaknesses. Mm, yeah. You know, and so yeah. this is something I think it's important for church members and, and others to recognize. We as pastors who have taken the, the mantle of sorts, if you want to call it that, uh, are, are suffering the same ailments mm -hmm. as those who are in our pews. Yeah. Um, and we are called to go before the same God who has the solution for us. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. There are some that, um, especially in the past, it's becoming less so now, yeah. but especially in the past, there's this sense that um, of equating um, pastoral ministry to a priesthood mm. and um, adding a certain level of otherworldliness to yeah. it. Right. Yeah. And saying that, oh, they need to be more than or better than the rest of the community of mm -hmm, faith mm -hmm. um, because they need to represent that community right. of faith before right. God. So there is that that sense. But you're pointing out that even with the priesthood, when they were separated by God from the rest of the community, God is also identifying Well, the book, book of he the writer of Hebrews is identifying that they they were sinful humans themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, pastors do floss and they have to take showers. <laughs> Otherwise, they will they will smell, you know. Yeah. Yeah, these things that, that you normally don't think of, oh, they're not a, a regular human being. Um, we, we are. And um, beyond that, the, the New Testament doesn't seem to make a distinction between pastors and, and the rest of God's people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that sometimes we make. Yeah. That all... People are priests. Mm. All of God's followers mm. are are part of His mm. royal priesthood, mm. like it says in Second Peter, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I would I would add to that and say, we all function in that role because 
we all can draw people to the source of the greatest sacrifice, yeah. right? You have the opportunity to lead your coworker, to lead your family member, to lead your children in knowing, loving, and receiving the gift, the greatest sacrifice, which is Christ. So that's why you are too a priest, because you're doing the role that was called upon uh, the Old Testament role. Hey, you're taking the sacrifice. You're giving them uh, help to the remission of sin through this blood. And so that's something that we can all do right now, which yeah. is an amazing gift, yeah. actually. Yeah. Do we take it seriously, though? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I remember the sermon that um, Pastor Randy preached. Now it's it was back in November mm -hmm. or so, um, where he said, "You, we are all someone's priest. Hmm. We are all someone's priest." Oh, interesting. And that is a powerful dynamic that I, I hope we're going to get into a little bit more at the end of our discussion today. But just just keep that in mind as as we talk today that we are all someone's priest, which means that what we're discussing today is not just theoretical, it's very practical to us because this is this is a calling that we are all called to, mm. to follow in the footsteps mm. of Jesus. Mm. And Jesus, according to the writer of Hebrews, is greater than, mm. greater than all of those Levitical priests mm. that stood in between. They stood in the gap and act as that bridge between God and man. Mm. Jesus was greater than that, them, mm. and we are supposed to follow in in Jesus's footsteps. Oh, wow. footsteps. So what does that look wow. like? But let's 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 get well, into it a little bit. Now I wonder, just to take one step backwards, talking about the image of priests, yeah. and now relating that to this day and pastor. Okay, so now we've kind of leveled the playing field. Mm -hmm. Do you think that culture has so leveled the playing field mm -hmm. that now it's even diminished? <laughs> so that the image and vision of pastor, minister, priest is so low hmm. that it's almost like looking down upon you know that would need i mean we need to look at the various contexts but definitely i do think some of the shine of um um uh, that have that has been on pastors and priests or if you're talking about the roman catholic church um has been taken off a bit because scandals mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of looking at um, these people that you normally put on pedestals and they, they didn't really seem to live up to that ideal um, because like you said we are human mm. we are fallen human beings mm. and when the reality of that comes to the fore um, I think it it helps it disappoints people mm -hmm. and when you're disappointed by they, they say you should never meet your heroes right mm. when you're disappointed by people that you thought were at a higher place and then you realize that they're not it does seem to drop them even lower yeah but i think the problem initially does come from putting anybody on that pedestal mm. because really none of us should be on that pedestal mm. right even jesus when the when uh, the a rich young ruler came up to him and said good teacher he yeah. said why do you call me good yeah right no one is good yeah right so i think that really should be the response of us as pastors mm. is if someone is wanting to put us on the pedestal to yeah. say you know what we are just fellow fellow journeyman. believers yeah. fellow journeymen on this this journey towards towards god yeah so we need to be taken what, off that What do you do with the passage when Paul, though, says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That you, you're, you're also called to, yeah. to call people, to, hey, look at how I'm running the race. I want you to run that in this way as well because my eyes are set and fixed on the prize, which is Jesus, you know. Yeah. Um, man, that is wow. a tough place yeah. to realize, like, wow, uh, do not take for granted the call to be a teacher, as Paul says. A uh, one who beckons the word to God's people because there is a high calling to it too. Yeah. You know, and so while we talk about, hey, we are all weak and and we are in dealing with the same type of sins and mm -hmm. we do the same things that everyone else does, there's also this level of, wow, wait a second. There is also a reverence I've got to live up to in this. Yeah, it is a high calling. Yeah. I'm reminded of um, a DC Talk song from a long time ago. <laughs> Joey, I'm dating yourself. When. I'm definitely dating myself. 
But there, there is a line that has stuck with me or several lines that have stuck me, with okay. me. And it goes, what if I stumble? What if I fall? Mm. What if I lose my step and make fools of us all? Mm. Right? Talking about how, if I am called, and this is not a pastor speaking, this is a Christian speaking and saying, how do I live up to this high calling that God has called me to? How mm. do I say, um, this is who Christ is like. I'm trying to live out who yeah. Christ is like yeah. in your life when I realize that I'm still a broken, fallen human being, mm. right? Um, you know, it's kind of why I don't put Christian bumper stickers on my car because <laughs> maybe I don't always want people oh, to know, man. right? So that 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 fear of misrepresenting God yeah. sometimes does keep us mm. from for standing up for God. Mm. But what I think we need to realize is that despite the fact that we are broken, mm. we are we don't ever live up fully to what God has called us to be. Right. That shouldn't make us afraid to mm. stand up boldly for mm. him and yeah. say, I am broken, yeah. but I am trying to follow him and and, and love our mm. world mm. as best as I can. And God is continuing to grow that mm. within me. Mm. I think it was um, Ruth um, Graham that said that, um, I, that she wanted um, a road sign um, uh, to be put, put on her, um, her grave when she died. And the road sign was, um, um, still in construction. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> right. And that really, I think that that's the state for all of us. We're still that. in construction. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And we need people's patience. That's such a, such a tough space to be in. I think when you sense the call, but I also love the fact that as the text gets to, which maybe we can go to next, is there is a sacrifice. Mm. And the sacrifice is there for us, mm. for each one of us. Mm. Chapter 6 goes into this a little bit more, that one can't be saved again. It mm -hmm. says, if you've fallen, it's impossible. And, and maybe in some of the other lessons, it'll get into this. But the idea is there can't be salvation again for you if there's no sense of repentance. Mm. If you have no repentance, you can't be saved again when you fall. Mm. You have to humble yourself. Yeah. Every single one of us, when you make a mistake in this life, ignorantly or intentionally, you have to fall to your knees and repent of that. Otherwise, there is no forgiveness for you. 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful to forgive those who confess their sins. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important aspect to this journey recognizing, hey, we're all a work in progress, and especially for the fact that if we're willing to humble ourselves, God will, though, raise us up again. Yeah. Where we can still, in some confident but yet humble way, say, hey, come follow me. Even when I fall, I want you to know where I'm going back up to. I'm going back up to the Father, and I'm praying for forgiveness. That's my kids, too, mm -hmm. right? Recently, I, I, I did something, yelled a little bit loudly, got angry with my daughter. She wasn't listening. And I was like, why did I need to do that? I didn't need to do And I looked at her and I said, Petra, I'm so sorry. Mm. I'm so sorry. And she looked at me and she said, that's okay, dad. Yeah. And she gives me a hug, you know, oh, wow. that journey that we could go through that yes. together. She recognizes I'm a fallen human being. I'm trying to do my best here, but I, I didn't hold my cool well. Yeah. But there's that offer of forgiveness that she gave me, which was so precious yeah. on her part. Three year, almost three year old. She's two. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I I agree with you that we don't put enough emphasis on that process of re re repentance and mm -hmm. redemption, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's because there is this core belief within us that people don't change. Mm. That I don't really expect broken people to change. I don't really yeah. expect myself yeah. to change, yeah. right? And so that leads us to just one of two options. One option is hiddenness, where mm. we just hide that brokenness and pretend it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is where a lot of Christians find themselves. We just hide that brokenness and say, well, as long as nobody knows it's there, yeah. maybe I can live with it, right? Right. right. Or the second option mm. is to just give up and be mm. fatalistic and say, well, this is who I am. I'm never gonna change. So take me as I am or don't take me at all, mm. right? So that, and that's the, the sense that most um, people who have kind of given up on uh, religion, 
um, live in, mm. right? One of those two spaces. Mm. And yet what the Bible seems to be clear about is, yes, we're broken people and we may never be um, completely unbroken this side of heaven, but there is an expectation of healing and growth mm, mm, that mm, that mm. that brokenness will continue to we will continue mm. to improve yeah and that growth is expected yeah and but it only comes from what you talked about from true repentance right from actually examining that brokenness being honest about it mm. actually sharing that with other people mm -hmm. and going through a process of healing mm. that leads to redemption mm. Mm. and yet because we we are unwilling to do that and we sort of believe that people don't change how we handle when when the hiddenness fails ultimately it always fails right yeah, yeah. when the hiddenness fails and the sin comes out how we deal with it is basically we shame people yes. we punish them yes. and then if enough time has passed and we feel like they've been shamed and punished enough, then we let them come back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's not real healing Oof. that we lead them through. Oh, man. Because we don't expect it to happen. Yeah. Young people feel that I think a lot in, in circles that I'm around where they feel like the church is just such a judgmental space yeah. where they don't have enough money in the bank to fail around the church folk. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, I don't want to come here and admit my faults because this is where I'll be judged. Mm -hmm. Where in essence, though, the church should be a landing and holding space yes. where there is grace for our failures yeah. and restoration to the community. Yeah. That was the whole point of the sacrifice here. Yeah. The, the priest would take the sacrifices for the people. Yes. For what reason? Mm. To restore right relationships. Yes. Sin causes a brokenness of relationship. When we are in sin, we're in as darkness, as you point out, and there isn't clarity and light on who's in the room here. It's yeah. like you want to hide yourself from the room. Adam and Eve clothed themselves with the leaves, so you can't really see who I am, but that's not relationship. God wants and yearns for restoration. So when, mm -hmm. when the church can be at its best, at its best, and I want to talk to those of you who are here and that you might have been hurt by the church. The church at its best should be a landing space mm. for our brokenness. When it isn't, that is a difficult space because you're in the power now, actually, believe it or not, to offer forgiveness. You didn't live up to your best. And it's usually not, we call it the church, mm. but it's really people in the church, right? Yeah. The people make up the church, the ecclesia. And it's in those times when the broken actually have the opportunity to say, I forgive you, though I will still learn to kind of trust you slowly, mm. but I forgive you. You yeah. didn't live up to the best space that you were called to be, which is a holding tank for my sin. Whoo, yeah. man. And showing that kind of grace doesn't mean that we excuse sin. We're right. not saying that sin right. is okay. Right. right? We right. we we are recognizing how incredibly destructive sin is. Right. Which why which is why it's so important for us to go through this process of purging that sin from our lives. But mm -hmm. that purging, at least according to Scripture, seems to only come when we are honest mm. and we confess our sins, like it says in James, right? Confess your sins mm. to each other, mm. right? So that. That cleansing comes when we are able to be transparent and honest. But unless we create those kind of spaces mm. where people feel safe yeah. to confess and yeah. be honest and yeah. to be accepted and to be led through a change process, mm. unless that happens, then true healing can't happen. Mm. And that is, one of the, that is one of the most beautiful gifts that we can offer this world mm. is that healing is possible yeah. when we have that kind of community of grace yeah. and faith yeah i remember walking through a journey of james 5 8 confess your sins therefore one to another and pray for each other mm -hmm. that you may be healed yes it's almost like there's a sequence yeah. of sorts it's it's this necessity to bring light to the darkness yeah. i've confessed it i brought it forth it brings freedom to the soul yeah when you confess your sin actually one young man that I was working with that ended up in prison, he said, I'm so glad to be here. And I think I might have shared this before. Yeah. I'm glad to be here because everything's come to light. Mm -hmm. And then there's this aspect, this next step, which is the role of the priest, mm -hmm. of all of us, 
to pray for one another. Yeah. You don't leave people in the midst of just confessing this just alone in that space. Now it is, hey, let's take this before God. Yeah. Take this before God. And I would also add, sometimes in the process of accountability with people that I've done this with, I ask them this. After we've prayed, do you still sense a feeling of guilt over you? Mm. And sometimes there's this word of, yeah, I do. And I ask, why is that? Yeah. And there's this aspect of needing to go to the person they've harmed because mm. they realize I haven't done that, yes. which is the call of the New Testament. Hey, yeah. go to your brother and sister mm -hmm. before you kind of get this full healing. And so I think that the prayer portion that James points out is, is also, hey, we need to communicate. Communicate with the broken, but communicate the one we've hurt, communicate with God. And then the final step, healing emerges. Mm. But if someone still struggles to say, I don't feel like my conscience is clear, mm. then you have to ask yourself, are you trying to play God and beat yourself over the head longer than God requires? You can feel bad. Mm -hmm. I remember one young man, he ended up being a wild and reckless young teenager, drives through a stop sign going over a hundred miles an hour on a Michigan road and he kills a family. Mm -hmm. I knew his two sisters. Wow. That young guy dealt with the regret. What did I do? I took that might stay with him, but mm -hmm. he also has to get to a point of recognizing he went to prison. He paid for his public sin. He's prayed and asked for forgiveness. He's spoken to the family. And at that point, there, there has to be a sense of saying, there is nothing I can do to bring these people back, to bring this moment back when I was in sin. But what I can do is change the future actions of my life and be an advocate for, you know, not to be drunk and driving or to do other things. You know, it's just, you can do something in the future then. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that we don't get debilitated by the guilt and the shame yeah. of, of what we've done because yeah. God is always trying to lead us towards mm -hmm. restoration. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we can just forget it and pretend it right. never happened. Right. That's right. always right. going to be a part of our lives, yes. right? But that hopefully will lead us to something healthier yes. and it will lead us to a restoration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, not to bring in, I guess, a public policy here, but when we talk about prison reform, I think there needs to be a societal reform when it mm -hmm. talks about sins of people's actions and how they hurt society. Um, I remember being in a church community in the Midwest, loved this place, loved the church and the people there, but there was a fear with the with the prisoners who had been released that had been doing Bible studies, our Adventist Bible study series, and they come to the church actually. It's like, Whoa, I didn't think you'd be here really. Uh, wow. Uh, okay. Hi, brother. So and so let me grab my children and let's run to the next corner yeah. here. Um, when, when people pay for quote unquote their sin, there has to also be obviously an intelligence that we approach them with. Of of not placing them in the treasury department if they were a thief of some you know and you know, but there also has to be a, a sense of reconciliation has occurred mm -hmm. with the community with God. Now I too have to treat the one who was guilty differently. Wow, and that is a challenge. Yeah. That was a challenge for this church community I was pastoring, but it's also a challenge for us regularly to build again the relationships with those that hurt us in our atmosphere it might be a colleague it might be a spouse it might be a child a business partner other you know it's like wow when people have quote unquote paid for their sins yeah we've got to act different now yeah we can't keep them shamed like you said shamed mm -hmm. forever yeah yeah and and that may be a process right like it you is were talking about it it's is. not like all of a sudden it's all forgiven, all gone, right. and we trust right. that trust needs to be rebuilt. Right. right? And, yes. Yes. But the problem is a lot like you're pointing mm -hmm. out, the problem is often we don't have a process yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. And we just kind of go by, well, has enough time passed? Past. Yeah. Rather than actually engaging in an yes. intentional process of healing and restoration. And the guilty party needs to recognize that. Yeah. 
You know, they can't assume that everything's going to be just fine again. I've I've experienced that in marriage counseling with couples and and one of the spouses is just like they keep holding this against me. Mm. You know, I just don't feel like I can move on with our marriage in this type of Hey, that's what you kind of get for a season. Mm-hmm. I think it can only be a season. It cannot be permanent. But the other spouse needs to to sense that there's actions that are different, need to sense that you've really changed, that this isn't going to just come back again. And so the guilty and the one that has been hurt work together. Mm. But like you said, in a process. Yeah. Too many times it's kind of invisible and we don't communicate the process. Yeah. And that's really what Jesus did for us, right? Mm. He came to reconcile the two parties us who had broken and broken up from god Mm -hmm. and god Mm -hmm. he was to act as that bridge and according to the writer of hebrews he does it even greater than the levitical priesthood because Mm -hmm. that was their role Mm. right aaron and his descendants were to be that bridge but according to the writer of hebrews jesus is even greater than them Mm. so in in what way is jesus greater than the levitical priesthood Yeah, I mean, you know, like the very first section here said, um, verse 3, this is why the priest has to offer sacrifices for their own sins because they are subject to infirmities and weakness. Mm -hmm. But Jesus isn't. He did not sin. He was perfect. And so Jesus is different in that very basic way as a human who was subject to human um, ailments he did not fall to temptation. Yes. So that's the first thing I think of. Yeah. What about you? What's another thing that makes well, him different? Well, let's let's read what in the writer of Hebrews says in verses 5 through 10. It okay. says, in the same way, so in the same way as the Levitical priesthood, Christ did not take on upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Mm. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever Mm. in the order of Mm. Melchizedek. Mm. Mm. During the days of Jesus's life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Mm. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then, and then he kind of goes on the side tr- um, journey and then continues this in chapter seven in describing of yeah. how Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, that Melchizedek, you know, didn't come from the Aaronic lineage, yeah. right? He was just called by God and yet he was a priest. So yeah. he was greater than um, Aaron, bec- um, the other priests that came after Aaron, because they were only priests because of the lineage, their connection mm, to Aaron. Mm. But Melchizedek was called directly by God mm. to be a priest, just like Jesus was directly called mm. by God. Mm. And then he uses um, some poetic metaphors to talk about how he didn't have a father and mother. Of course, Melchizedek did have uh, uh, have parents, yeah. but Jesus, Jesus was an eternal God, right? Mm. Just as he was human, he was also God. Mm. And so it makes that connection that Jesus Jesus was indestructible. He had an indestructible life. Mm. And that was proven through the mm. fact that he was resurrected from mm. the dead. Mm. And so what Jesus brings that all of these other, other priests didn't bring was, first of all, like you said, he is blameless and sinless. Uh-huh. But he also he also proved that his path worked because he was resurrected from the dead, yes, which yes, none of these other yes, priests right, ever were right, resurrected right, from right, the right. dead. Yeah. yeah. And, and the fact that you said he was called, unlike the lineage of yeah. Aaron, yeah. he was called directly by God. Here we you have these quotes from the Psalms and uh, Psalm 2 and then 110. I think it's also interesting here that it says he was reverent in submission and that he learned obedience yeah. from what he suffered. Wow. Joey, we might come into a little uh, taboo subject here. <laughs> but can God mm-hmm. learn? Yeah. Is he subject to this need to obey? Yeah. What's going on here? This is quite the topic, brother. I know. You know, the, I, 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 I like how the... 
the author of our uh, the lesson study for this week touched upon that aspect of obedience at uh. least right that as god jesus really didn't need to obey but that when he came here on earth he submitted himself with god so he learned obedience in a very different way than he had in the past huh, he what do you what obedience. do you mean what do you so mean so that was a new experience for jesus as as god he in a sense he obeys the other members of the godhead because mm. they are in submission to each other yeah. right but it was a very different thing when he came here and on earth ah, and became like a human, human okay. form, a, becoming fully human and fully God. Mm. He experienced obedience in a way that he had never before. Mm. Um, partially, I think, because, and this is just my conjecture, partially because he didn't have all the knowledge of the universe in his mind when he was here on earth. I can't believe that as a baby he was born with all the knowledge and yeah. omniscience and yeah. all of those things yeah. were limited. So he experienced life in a very different way than he had ever experienced mm. life before. And that was chosen on his yeah. part. Yeah, he so chose it, to it, do that. It was, I forgot the philosophical term that one one was used, but it's it's a it's a uh, a limit that God put on himself. Yeah. So you can't say he's still now not all powerful and all knowing. Because God chose this upon himself. And it reminds me of, of Luke chapter 2. Mm -hmm. When Jesus is in the temple. And there's yeah. a very very profound few verses there at the end of the chapter. Where you can see the psychosocial development mm -hmm. of Christ explained. I want to yeah, go there just for a moment. Before someone starts calling, calling us a heretic here. Um, here Jesus goes down. And uh, he looks at his mom Mary and father Joseph. When they were freaking out, when they couldn't find them, there he was in the temple. And he, in verse 49, chapter 2, why were you searching for me? He asked, didn't you know I had to be of my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. So even as a young child, he did have almost like a, a larger consciousness mm -hmm. of sorts of, of who he was and what he was doing. But then pay attention to this. Then he went to Nazareth with them. And was obedient to them. Mm -hmm. Here's that idea of obedience again. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Mm -hmm. So he grew in his physiology. Mm -hmm. He grew in his intellect and understanding, this idea of wisdom. And he grew in just kind of this societal favor, blessing amongst people. So there was this notion of progression that was occurring. Mm -hmm. But did he mean he was doing something wrong and it was corrected? I don't think that's what it's necessarily mm -hmm. pointing to. So let's not put Jesus to be in the box of he had committed sin and then he had pro, you know, been forgiven. No, 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 it's, hey, I'm learning with you as my physiology is increasing from being a little boy to being now a man. You know. And this is something that we've talked about in this Sabbath school discussion before, is this idea of perfection and how um, a lot of times our understanding of perfection comes from the Greek philosoph philosophical idea of perfection, which mm. is changelessness. Something mm. that is perfect is absolutely perfect for all time and it cannot change. Otherwise, it would no longer be perfect. You mm. can't consider it perfect. Mm. Well, the Hebrew concept of perfection was very different. The Hebrew concept of perfection was an idea of perfection for what something is at the stage that it is in. Mm. So we can think of a baby being perfect. When we, a baby is born, it's we say that it's perfect, mm. meaning that it has 10 fingers and 10 toes, <laughs> and it's healthy and all, all of those things, that this baby is perfect. But does that mean that the baby can't change? Mm. No. Actually, part of the reason why we say that it's perfect is because precisely because it is growing. Mm. If the baby stopped growing, it would no longer be perfect anymore, uh, right? Yeah. So there's this idea that perfection is actually an, um, a, a, that growth is actually a part of being perfect. Mm. So Jesus could still be perfect as a baby. He could be perfect as a child, but that doesn't preclude him from growing and learning and developing because that was a part of what it meant to be a baby mm. and a child mm. that he needed to grow in stature, wisdom and stature with God and man, in favor mm. with God and man. So there is this sense that growth is a part of a perfection. Mm. Um, and so it does seem that Jesus did grow. He did learn 
um, as a human, um, what it meant to follow God, and what it meant to to live life here on earth. Mm. And maybe even Jesus as God learned something different from being with humans. Now, I know that's, that's getting into little little choppy You're waters here. some gray area. <laughs> and I'm not but... necessarily saying that this has to be true, but you know, the, the writer of Hebrews does make this connection mm. between how um, what made the priests able to do their work was that they came from among the people, mm. right? That, mm. is a, that is a tenet of what he's saying, that they understood the failings of humanity mm. because they, were, they came from among mm. the people. And that's- Yeah, and, they could have empathy. Yeah, they yes. could have empathy. Mm -hmm. from living among them. And so, you know, we can say that Jesus came down to show that he understood when he already did understand humanity, mm. to show that he, to prove that he understood us, he came among men. Mm. But I wonder if perhaps God, Jesus himself learned something from that experience mm. in that um, becoming and living among God, living among men, having to be obedient to human parents. Mm was an experience that he had never had before. Oh, sure. So is it possible yeah. that that experience also taught him Shaped. and helped him understand mm. better what humans were going mm. through mm. and enabled mm. him to even mm. be a better mediator mm. between mm. God I mean, and man? Uh, what happens in Hebrews later on, or was it before now, I'm forgetting, that, hey, we have such a high priest who knows our infirmities, yeah. who knows our temptations, yeah. And can yet still offer forgiveness for us, you know. So it's like, I've been in your shoes. Yeah, I know what it's like. Yeah. So kind of what you're saying is is right in line with that, with what Hebrews points to. Jesus understands and has the deepest form of empathy because he walked that same path. Yeah. By choice. Yeah. yeah. And and honestly, if I'm comparing my life to Jesus's he experienced much more extreme versions of pain and suffering oh, yeah. than, than I ever have, right? Yeah. So he's gone deeper into the, yes. the, um, the sufferings of humanity than yes. I hopefully yes. ever will experience myself. Yeah. And so uh, that's the journey that Jesus took for, upon himself. If I can just point to one thing here, which I just think is so profound, it was that this reverent submission, verse uh, 8 and 9, it, it came about out of suffering. Mm. The learned obedience, the, the process of submission came out from suffering. I, I preached recently on Judges chapter 2. Okay. And it's there when another generation arises that did not know God nor his works mm. of the past. And God allowed them to fall into suffering so that mm. they might come back to him. Wow. You know, you now I'm not I'm kind of deviating a little bit from from where we are, but just the idea that suffering produces a beckoning call back to the Father. It 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 produces the opportunity for obedience and growth because the suffering causes us to finally look up at times. Not that mm -hmm. we've caused the suffering, not yeah. that it's always as a result of our uh, disobedience, but just simply that suffering gives us an opportunity to humble ourselves and then to look up to the Father and say, God, I, I need your help right now. Yeah. I'm in a difficult financial strait, relational strait, academic work. I'm just struggling, you know, psychosocially here in relationships with friends. Like, God, I, I need you. Mm -hmm. But it takes humility to get to that point. Yeah. So suffering has the opportunity to teach us something if we allow it to. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Jesus learned because he allowed the suffering to teach him. Yeah, yeah, that's so beautiful. And really where we wanna turn next is, is this idea that you know Jesus is a greater priest than all of the priesthood that preceded him. But we are to walk in his footsteps. Mm. Like um, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we are all a royal priesthood, mm. right? So if if we really believe that we are the priesthood of all believers, of all followers of God, so then what does that mean for us? What does it mean to follow in Jesus' footsteps mm. as priests? What mm. does that look like mm. for us as followers of Jesus? Mm. What would you say? Boy, 
I think something that we brought out early on really comes to mind is that as priests that we're all called to be, we all can usher people into the kingdom of God mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a conduit to draw them to the Father. Yeah. I'd say that's probably one of the biggest reasons. I yeah. would say that it comes to truth for me. Yeah. And one that we've talked about, what we mentioned earlier, one that sometimes we shy away from because we don't, we're a little bit afraid about saying that we are representing God Mm. to these people. But Mm. the reality is that for some people, we will be the first face of God that Mm. they will see, Mm. right? The way that we live our lives, the way that we communicate love to the people around us is an opportunity to show them a little bit of the love that Mm. we've received from Mm. God and from Mm. others Mm. in our lives. And it isn't to say that we are in any equality with God, right? That That isn't what we're saying here, but it is that we bear like the moon is the reflection of the sun. The reason why you see it up in the sky is because it's reflecting the light from the sun. Likewise, we do the same. We reflect the light of the Father, the Son, the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit to those around us. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. like how one, one writer put it, our life is the fourth gospel, the fifth gospel. You know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you're like, wait, there's a fifth one? Yeah, it's your life. Your mm-hmm. life tells wow. the story of Jesus to the world, to yes. others around you. Yeah. Um, so that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. And then the, the other side of the coin, because the priest was not only supposed to represent God to man, but also man to God, right? Mm. So that other flip side of the coin is, is the, the way that we can empathize mm. with the people around us. Mm. That we are, yes, we are in, but not of, right? Yes. Um, that, that's how God, Jesus describes his, his followers that we need to actually be among people. Mm. We have to empathize with mm. them right? That we need to understand the experiences that they're going through. Otherwise, we can't communicate effectively God's love Mm. to them if we don't first understand. Mm. It's Mm. not us Mm. walking by and just, I mean, I I love literature ministries and handing out pamphlets. I think they're a powerful way of leading people to God. But unless it's done with love, unless it's done with understanding, it can't, it doesn't have the same impact and effectiveness mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so we need we need to walk we need to both uh, be connected with god enough that we can show his love to people but be connected with the people that we're trying to reach so that we are actually we empathize with them and mm-hmm. show love mm-hmm. to them i really also like one added aspect which will come on later maybe and that is the, the idea that jesus is interceding yeah right and so when you talk yeah. about well what can you do to follow yes. christ Hey, my role, like you brought out, the second aspect is to draw God's people to the Father through prayer. Mm -hmm. I can intercede. And that's something you can do today for someone in your life that you know is hurting, is broken, is struggling with addiction or some form of sin or just in a difficult season. Your call as a believer is to bring them before the Father because it is in that place that Jesus, by your prayer, can then move into their life. And that is a powerful thing that you and I have the ability to do. That's what Jesus is doing right now on all of our behalves. Yeah. And and I love love that you use that word call because priests are called, Mm -hmm. right? That's the point that you brought up. Yeah. And if we're all priests, that means that we are all called, Mm. right? Um, And this is something that we've discussed before, this idea of um, whether a pastoral calling is different mm. than a calling for for everybody else, um, you know, I used to think that. Uh, I used to approach pastoral calling that way. That oh, that there was there's a special type of calling reserved for pastors. But as I study Scripture more, and especially as we've journeyed through this idea of a priesthood of all believers, um, uh, the unprofessional series that mm. Pastor Randy preached the more and more I'm coming to believe that all our callings, we are all called people. Mm. We are called to different things, Mm. but we are all called people. Mm. And sometimes our callings will be the same as our careers. Mm. And sometimes our callings will be different than our careers. Mm. But that that God does have a place and a people Mm. that he wants us to reach, Mm. every single one of us. Mm. And so it is an act, it is the, it is necessary for us to really discover what 
what God has called us to do and who God has called us to reach. Mm. Who are the people around us that God wants us to be mm. a priest in their mm. lives too? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Philip, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I resonate and I also see the idea of calling uniquely in that there, there are multiple callings, right? We are all called to salvation. We are all called to unique ministries. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I would add another layer of that some are then even called to pastoral ministry, mm -hmm. to to limit themselves <laughs> in this humanness of sense of saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be a go-between for God's people to some degree to help you find your way to Christ. Not that I will stand in the place as Jesus does, but I'm going to, I'm going to help lead you there. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is is called to vocational ministry like mm -hmm. no one, not all are called to being a plumber or a teacher or mm -hmm. to be a nurse in healthcare, a physician or something else, you know. Uh, so I think there are multiple calls mm -hmm. and we're all called to something different based on the unique gift sets mm -hmm. that God has given us. Yeah. And uh, I pray that each one of you senses a call in your life to do something for Jesus, no matter what field you're in, you are called to be a priest of all believers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. Some of the callings that, that uh, we receive, we receive are to call a call to serve within the church organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as it describes in Ephesians chapter two, that some, there are some callings, there's some spiritual gifts, uh, teachers and evangelists that are supposed to equip people for for ministry yeah right and so the whole the whole idea is within the church you equip people that there are some callings called to equip people to do ministry but that ministry can happen within the context mm -hmm. of the church and it can happen outside of the church mm -hmm. um one of my favorite um metaphors in it, with this idea is that you know a lot of times we've thought of the church as a restaurant mm. where people come to be served right but what if we were not a restaurant? What if we were like a depot for food trucks, mm. right? Where they, where food trucks would come to be, re, you know, to be recharged, to to get their supplies, yeah. to be equipped and trained, yes. and then sent out yes. into the world. I love that to serve. Love that, right? Yeah. Um, what if we were a food truck commissary, right? <laughs> that, that, that is the role of of the church. Yeah. And, and some of us, some of us, like uh, as pastors. We serve within that 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 um, that equipping equipping depot, right, 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 right. But there are people that we send out and hopefully into the world mm -hmm, to do mm -hmm, service mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. for the world around yeah. us. I've heard it said this way, and I know we probably need to close. But you know, the church is is not the fan in the stands watching the game. They're actually the player who's sitting there at halftime listening to the coach getting excited, learning the plays, and they're about to get on the field. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the church. Yeah. And if we confuse that, finding ourselves to be, well, I feel better as a, in the pew. I'll pay for the ticket, yeah. which provides the venue. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. You have a part to play. Yeah. Every one of you. Mm -hmm. You're all on the field. You know, yeah. some are the coach, some are the defensive linemen, some's the, you know, offensive kicker. It's just that everyone has a different role. But we're all actually playing on the field. Yeah, we're a part of the success. Yeah, and as a football fan, I'd I'd like to say that I I, I feel like I am a part of the success of my team as well. <laughs> the louder I cheer, the stands actually make yeah. a difference. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get your point. Yes, we are all called to be a part of the ministry of God, whether that co that call happens within the context of the church community or outside in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. um, we that is our calling. Yeah. Philip, will you wrap us up? Yeah, her? yeah, absolutely. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we got to share together. Mm -hmm. Jesus, my prayer is that you would fill every single one of us with a hope for this week that we, A, have been forgiven, and B, that we are called to be ministers who are both broken and in need of Christ to usher others into that same space. Lord, may we follow after you faithfully, to be wisely called into ministry as priests of the blessed hope of the New Testament, all of us together, leading God's people to greater faithfulness. Jesus, we yearn for your second coming. We yearn for that day we'll see you in the clouds. And so today, Father, I pray 
we would sense that hope that you are the one who is coming and we want to see as many come with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friends, we are all called to be a priest in someone's life. So can go out there and connect someone to Jesus. Have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath to all of you out there. Sheila and I here together. We're going to give you a quick tour of our new facility, but we're standing here in a special place. Uh, uh, Sheila, what we're standing in front of right now? Well, we're excited to show this whole place to you. We're standing in front of the studio that we've been working in for 15 years. It's had a lot of different renovations, but um, we're just right in, would you say in front? Yeah. We're on the side of it, sort of like. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like on the side. Wonderful. And, and just on the precipice of the new exciting building that you have blessed us with your gifts, that um, with God's help, this has been created. Amen. Amen. So we're going to show you this, pro this project as a testimony of what God has done here for LLVM. But before we go any further, we're going to have verse of the day. Sheila, you have it? I do. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's correct, Sheila. Uh, that was a great verse. As a matter of fact, this verse reflects the very essence of topics were discussed into Christian connections that we recorded last week. Your last chance to tune into it this evening at the scheduled time you see at the bottom of the screen. You know, faith is what built LLVN. Faith is what brought us all together here, Sheila. Faith, what helped us develop this place behind us, because we never had the money when we bought the property. Mm -hmm. We borrowed and we fixed it, we paid it off, and we've been debt free since. And it was faith that we stepped out in to build this building in, because we thought we had all the money to start, but soon before the beginning, we realized that money was not going to cover all expenses because of COVID-19 increased cost of material that jumped up to by 30, 40 percent, in some cases, 100 percent. So we knew by faith we have to continue. And through faith, God helped LLVN have a new facility here for his Amen. own glory. Yes, that's so exciting. I'm excited to show it to our viewers. Yeah, you know, we all are because... They're the ones who deserve to see it. Since yes. They, you were our partner throughout the whole process. And you helped to shape our faith by your support and your involvement with us because it made us know that there are partners like you out there who believe in what we're doing. Well, uh, we have sponsors today for the live broadcast. I mean, we, we have sponsors all throughout the week. But we always try to pick up, focus on the four who we picked for the live broadcast. So who do you have for us? We have the Fendel family from Maryland, the Wichinich family from California, the Bone family from Oregon, and the Trey family from Georgia. I hope I didn't mess up your names, but please forgive me. And you could write in and let me know um, how to pronounce it next time. And special thanks to all of you folks, those who Sheila just mentioned, and yes. all of you who are sponsoring us throughout the week 24-7. Well, we do want to invite you to go to our website. There is continued growth on our website. Uh, uh, we just added the uh, uh, Romanian channel archives. It's kind of getting started there. So now there's nine channels on our website that you can get access to, although the Romanian channel is still under development, but now you can get a sneak preview mm -hmm. of what we have there. It's really exciting what Jesus is leading us with this ministry. So go to our website, LLBN.tv, 
download your phone app. If you have Apple or Android, they can go what? To the, to the App Store? They can. And just um, download LLBN TV. Yeah. No, not even TV, just, just LLBN. LLBN. Okay, yeah, Four that's letters. Right. All you and have to It has a dove, in. a white dove. That's it's really right. great. And, and, and you can enjoy LLBN nine channels from wherever you're at. You can be driving and listening, mm -hmm. or you could be at home watching, or you could be at the office listening as well. So That's right. And I just told my sister just to download it. She Good kept asking me, what channel is that? I go, just get the app. You can see it on your phone. You know, everyone so. I meet, I introduce my name and say, do me a favor, go to your phone, download the app, yeah. and then I'll continue the conversation. And I'm, you'd be surprised how many friends I build. This is how we expand the ministry, by you telling friends, and a friend tells yes. another friend. It's yes. really exciting, isn't it's, it? It's great, because wherever you are, you can watch it. You can have church wherever you go. I mean, I believe it's not just one day that you talk to God. It's... We live and he, he has our being, you know, right. so it's like we breathe it. And the more we do that, it just becomes more of who we are. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we pause here and have you read some of our lucky letter writings. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. We have letters from Dan from Seattle, Washington, who writes, Thank you all for what you do. LLBN is such a blessing. And Monica from Grand Terrace, California, says, I'm 85, and I love the Sabbath church service each Friday night. It's a blessing to have church on TV. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Monica. Should we pray for them now? Absolutely. Go ahead. Dan um, and Monica, dear God, we just present them to you. We lift them up in prayer. We thank you so much for their dedication and their love and prayers and the support for LBN. It's it's through the love of, and support of all our viewers that this is done. But most especially, it's because you bless us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God. And um, we ask you to continue to be with us and especially be with our viewers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So from locally at Grand Terrace to Washington to around the world, if you're watching, praise God. He has helped us build this new facility we started from cleaning up dirt, mm -hmm. paving the ground, and to where it's at now, right now. It is all for His glory, and we're going to give you a quick tour of what we have to show you today. Should we do it? Yes, let's go. Well, we just changed position, and I'm going to quiz Sheila, see how she, would de how she would describe what we're standing. Well, I would call this the hub that connects to everything. Like we have the old studio, and we have all the new things that we are going to explore together. So, Ganem, you could tell more about that. I'm impressed, <laughs> and it connects us to the upstairs wing, uh, south and north wings. Uh, this is truly the hub, the center connection, tying new and old and upstairs resources all in one. But we're going to take you right now to one of our video control rooms. So why don't we take you and show you what we have there? Well, now we're taking you in a very, very important room of our operation. And let's see if Sheila knows what this room is. Well, I just can see it says we are in some type of control room, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. You're absolutely right. You mean, you, you're a broadcaster now. You, you seem to... Well, this is very high everything. tech. I'm very, you know, I'm learning as our viewers. I'm learning with you viewers. So. Well, that, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. We're all growing together. This room is not completely furnished with all the complex electronics yet. But as you see, the room is ready, the monitor's hung, there's other layer of monitors, cables will be hidden, and there's equipment cabinets directly across mm -hmm. from us that will be populated with very high-cost broadcast equipment. Uh, but this room, essentially, can direct programs from any of our six different studio locations. So it's a very, very essential room to our operation. But it's kind of like the brains of Yeah, everything. it's like central mm -hmm. command center, for mm -hmm. lack of better words. But we have other technology room are equally important to this room. We're going to take you there next. So this is one of the other rooms. We clearly cannot show every room because several of them are just still empty. But Sheila, since you know so much about our development, what is this room? Well, this is the data processing room. So it's really exciting, Dean Ganem. I can't tell you. I'm really excited about looking at all of this and just seeing the fruition from literally dirt 
to this wonderful building. See what God can do. It's so amazing. It's amazing, which is why you want to tune in to Christian Connections this evening, because it talks about faith. It's a great program, and this whole building, again, built by faith. We have Jessica Paley here. You want to say, wave your hands to the cameras. Hi, Jessica. Uh, this room has been tested with the computer terminals surrounding the room, and that's where we do all the data processing for information, uh, and uh, it's a very critical component of our day-to-day uh, -day operation. But let's continue on to show Sounds other parts good. of the other parts of the um, our organization. So I'm stepping here in this room. Sheila, why don't you come? and join me here in this room, and let's face the camera. And folks, this is another very critical room of our operation. There are two like it, but slightly different in, in, in shape and, and type of equipment. But here to my left, there are special electronic equipment rack where we would house very complex broadcast pieces of equipment as well here as we did in the other room. But this room has a very special function. We call it Master Control One. Sheila can explain to you what this room is purpose for. Well, basically, if there's something that goes wrong internationally with the feed, mm -hmm. this is the room that can help and control that. And they'll know right away if something breaks the feed. Is Precisely. That correct? Precisely. Okay. That's, that's excellent description. So we have worldwide distributions going through thousands of hubs across the world. And as Sheila said, if any of them go out of service or fail to operate, our staff here will be able to tell that it went down in real time so they can make the proper calls to restore the service. And there will be more monitors, of course, installed on the wall. This is just in its preliminary phase of housing it with equipment. But there's more. We're going to take them upstairs and give them a tour. Are you up to it? Sounds good. So we're here in the middle in a very, very important room. And what is it called? The master video control room number two. That's correct, number two. So this room has a many, many purposes. It's truly a multi-purpose room. More monitors going on the walls, three layers of small monitors all the way across. Cabinets here with equipment will be housed with very complex technologies to do what? To be able to pull in international feeds and productions from around the world. This room will be able to do five to six mul uh, uh, simultaneous live productions either from locally or internationally or combined of all that and this room also where we can do all the live switching between program to program as you see on Sabbath when University Church airs we switch back between week review and we put a little music and fillers between that requires special switching and operation this room will do that as well important room keep it in mind in the future you'll see the result and the work of this room coming your way. Let's go move on to show them the rest. Wow, this is about two-thirds the space of what we just toured. That's correct, that's correct. So this is all drywalled, uh, uh, cleaned, ready to go, electrical distributed throughout the, this place. It's place for growth. Uh, we have other plans, but you know, we have to make, we have to stop part of this construction to work with the money we have. Uh, this is where we look up to you, our dear partners, to help build this house of worship. It's a virtual house of worship that reaches the entire world with the word of God. So uh, uh, amazing what God has done for us, mm. Sheila. We have suffered during the building. We were hit by COVID. Uh, there's shortage in supply equipment and uh, supplies cost more than some cases doubled. Uh, it was hard work, hard labor. But look what we did. It's for the glory of our God. Amen. And your help and support made it possible, but much more needed. Last word, Sheila. That's right. It, it's all the gifts and the prayers that you have contributed. We're all together in this and all praise and glory to God. We want to be and continue to be LLBN, which is Lighting Lives, Blessing Nations. Amen. And may God bless you richly. And please do not forget your prayers for LLBN. We are viewer supported number. God bless you. Amen. God bless.
changing lives. Blessing nations and the So glad you've chosen to worship with us today on this very first Sabbath of February, our Black History Month, and this is a very special Black History Sabbath with guest speaker, guest musicians, which will be introduced later. Also want to let you know that there is a study guide, a free study guide available for you in the Welcome Center in the lobby. It's entitled Social Justice in the Word of God. The brainchild behind this is Dr. Calvin Rock, former chairman of the LLUH board, and also Dr. Mervyn Warren, who was the former dean of religion at Oakland University. We encourage you to pick up a copy at the Welcome Center in the lobby. Now we've got a lot going on in this worship service, so we just have one more announcement, and that is the Winter Girl Awards. Want to make sure you put this on your calendar. February 19 at 4.30 right here in the sanctuary. We'll be giving more information in coming weeks, but put that on your calendar. It's always a very important Vespers program. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, go to our website, LOUC.org. And I just want to wish you a wonderful and blessed Sabbath day.
Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Oh, that sounds like we're just waking up. Let's try it again. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord today, and we welcome you to the worship services here at Loma Linda University Church. And this special day is Black History um, um, celebration for this wonderful time of the month. And we're just excited that you can be here today to worship here with us. You look beautiful. If you look around at each other, look at someone beside you and say, you look beautiful. And then say, and so do I. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We welcome each of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are watching online, wherever you are in the world, we welcome you here to service today. We have a few special guests in particular we want to notice. First of all, we want to give a special welcome to the Kansas Avenue Praise Team for being with us today. It's good to have you with us. We praise God for you. You've blessed us the first service, and we know you're going to be a blessing again to us today. We also want to give a special welcome to Pastor Barone Savori. He just spoke at the anthem service. A wonderful job there, and we praise God for Pastor Barone Savori. He's a senior pastor of the Valley Fellowship Church in Rialto, California. We also want to give a special welcome to Brother David Anthony Johnson. He's a wonderful man of God, a wonderful, talented young man who you're going to hear do a wonderful recitation of one of the Martin Luther King's speeches. Truly anointed and gifted, and we're looking forward to him blessing us today. And for our featured speaker, our speaker is Dr. Ron C. Smith. He's a wonderful, dear friend of mine. He blessed us again, first service, and we're looking forward to him being with us again. Ron is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and a, truly a product of Christian education. He's a graduate of Oakwood University with a degree in theology. Then he did his MDiv at Andrews University. Then he did his Doctor of Ministry degree at Colgate Rochester Seminary in Rochester, New York. Then he also did a PhD in psychology at Fuller Graduate School of Psychology right here in Pasadena. So we're truly glad for you being with us, Dr. Ron. Um, he has pastored in many churches throughout the United States of America. And after serving eight years as vice president of the Review and Herald Publishing Association and editor of Message Magazine, Ron joined the Southern Union administration and served as executive secretary. Since 2011, he has served as the president of the Southern Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He is married to the beautiful Yolanda, who could not be with us today. They've been married, I thought, 41. He said it's 42 years. Amen. 42 years they've been married. And um, even though she's not here, we know you're watching in Atlanta, and we send our love to you, Yolanda, there in Atlanta. They have two adult children who they are very, very proud of. Of the many things that I could say about Ron, the most important, besides the fact of loving his dear wife for 42 years, is that he loves God. And he has a passion for seeing souls saved in the kingdom of God. So I want you to pray for him as God uses him today. I want to invite Pastor Randy. Let's give our own pastor a hearty amen as he comes forth now and does a special presentation. Pastor Adrian, I'm going to have you up here more often. They, they clapped when I came up. <laughs> it's a wonderful day, isn't it, to worship God. And I want to say thank you to Pastor Adrian, who has been the brainchild behind the worship service that you're going to be blessed by today. Amen. I better not clap or I'm pounding on the mic here. But thank you, Adrian, so much. It's a joy to work together with Adrian. I want to add my voice to another colleague of mine, and that's Stu Hardy's, who in the announcements told you about a study guide that is available out at the welcome desk. I want to encourage you to take a copy of it. Make it a companion throughout this month. There's much in here to be learned in many ways in which we can grow, understanding each other better and growing in the direction of justice. Let me just give you an example, some items that you may not know about our own faith and church. So the writers have a number of different did you know sections asking questions about things in this case such as our faith. Did you know that Sojourner Truth, famous matron of the Underground Railroad, accepted Adventist teachings? I didn't know that. Did you know Uriah Smith wrote against slavery in the Adventist paper, The Review and Herald? Did you know that Ellen White told Adventist men members, contrary to the law, not to return runaway slaves? 
Did you know that James White, her husband, protested against slavery in the Adventist paper, the Review and Herald? And we could go on from there. Things that we can learn to help us understand our African-American brothers and sisters and the history of that experience in this country and in this community. We can grow. We can become more deeply united as we understand each other better. So I just want to encourage you to take a copy and make this month a time to learn and grow. Adrian, thank you so much for your work on this weekend. It's deeply appreciated. Thank you, Pastor Randy. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome, welcome to worship.
be seated. I return time and again to those words from the Old Testament. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. We need more prayer. Today you may have come to worship with a special burden on your heart. There certainly are reasons for that, aren't there? Whether they be personal, marital, familial, whether they be communal, or whether they be those in the larger country and world, having to do with health, having to do with jobs, having to do with family breakdown, having to do with spiritual life. You may have come with a burden for someone else in your life, someone for whom you are praying in a special way. We want to honor that and invite you to come down to the front. You can kneel here across the front or even in the aisles. Just be a bit sensitive not to be too close to make those around you uncomfortable. But whatever that burden may be, bring it to this altar, to God in prayer, and join us as we pray. Come down as the praise team sings. to invite you, if you're able to do so, to kneel together as we pray. Gracious God, what a delight and what a joy it is to come to you in prayer. Even though we respond with deep gratitude, we come also with heavy burdens. We praise your name, but at times our praise comes from broken hearts. We honor and worship you, but at times we feel miles away from this service because of something, somewhere, someone, somewhere who's broken. So, Lord, we come with deep requests in our hearts and souls. Some are praying about physical realities, praying about a diagnosis that is very deadly, praying for the presence of Jesus, praying for wholeness of body and soul. Others are praying about broken relationships, fractured friendships. Others are praying for homes that have a, a deeper connection, reconciliation. We're all praying for our world. In a polarized and divided world, we, as the body of Christ, pray that we might be reconciled. Lord, there are many gulfs that separate us, black from white, is one we think of in a special way today. We pray that there would be repentance and reconciliation, that you would draw us together at the foot of the cross. Lord, I know that each soul that has knelt, and especially those who have come to the front, has a burden on his heart, a burden on her heart. I want to give just a brief time for each of us to communicate with you personally.
Thank you, gracious God, for drawing us to yourself, for hearing our prayers, and for promising through your Spirit to come alongside us so that we do not face what we face alone. Ever remind us that though we leave this place, we never leave the presence of God. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In your strength and your Good morning, church. A few months ago, as I was working here, a phone call came through. Someone just called up the church because they wanted to talk to a pastor. And let me tell you, if any of you want to do that, you are more than welcome to any time we're here. Today on the phone, there was a, a young lady and Oh, she'd had some struggles. We had a chat and I heard about some points of pain in her life and just listened, prayed with her. After a while, I heard in the background, her boyfriend wanted to know who was on the phone. And so she told him, oh, it's a pastor. And his reaction was really quite sweet. He was like, I want to talk to him too. So, so he got on the phone and oh, we had a chat. As we're chatting away, he says, listen, I know God is real. And so I said, okay, tell me how you know that. And he said, well, listen, about five years ago, I was walking down the street and there was somebody on the side of the street who was in need and so I pulled out $20 and I gave it to them. But then when it came to lunchtime, I suddenly realized at that point that that was the last money I had. I had no more cash, and I was very disappointed. And so I sat down at a bus stop, and there right beside me was a brand new crisp $20 note. <laughs> he then went on to say how he knew that he could live generously, and he loved kind of just providing for people around him because he felt taken care of. I don't think his theology is all that bad, actually. <laughs> In the book of Proverbs 19, verse 7, it says this, that the one who gives to those in need gives as if to God, and God will repay them. The thing I loved about his story is he didn't become like a millionaire. He just, he got the $20 back. We here at Loma Linda University Church, we love to give. And we give knowing that there is no way that our generosity can outpace the provision of our God. And so we love to give to our educational institutions, providing scholarships for those who need it. We love to give to our healthcare institutions, making sure that they can provide care to those who need it. We love to teach and to preach, to invite people to hear words of grace and truth about how they can live their lives well. And we just love to give. And so if you would like to partner with us in that, if you would like to give with us for those purposes, we would just be humbled and we would say thank you. Thank you for thinking on these things as the deacons come forward to collect the offering.
Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. You know, we failed to mention that these, these books that Pastor Randy told you about, they were given to us by the Black Ministries at the conference office. And so we just wanted you to know who has given those to us to give to you and how grateful we are to them for their generosity. The passage in scripture for today was chosen by our speaker, Dr. Smith. It's a very short passage, but it's full of beauty and full of power. It's found in John 8, verse 36. And it says, listen carefully to these powerful words. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. On August 28, 1963, God called a native son of the Deep South to address a crowd who had descended upon the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to plead for economic and political justice at an event called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That year commemorated the 100th anniversary of the historic Emancipation Proclamation. The day prior to the event, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. labored through the night and produced a speech he hoped would persuade government leaders and the public to take action against economic and racial injustice in America. This event would serve as Dr. King's debut on the national stage and give the civil rights movement broad media coverage. Against the backdrop of the Lincoln Memorial, amid its majestic columns, Dr. King came to the podium. With a quarter of a million in attendance and millions more listening by TV and radio, Dr. King began to address the crowd. Halfway into his speech, his friend, legendary gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, yelled to him from the sideline saying, tell them about the dream. Dr. King had shared his dream at other speaking engagements, but he had no intention of speaking about the dream that day. The man who believed the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, whose ears are open to their cry, put his notes aside. He was overshadowed by the spirit that moved in the movement. Laced with historical, literary, and biblical references, Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech in a soul-stirring voice. And after 60 years, the dream still lives. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to the millions of Negro slaves that had been seared in the withering flames of injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination 100 years later. Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty 
In the midst of the vast ocean of material prosperity, 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society. And he finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a very shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the great architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall out. This note was a promise that all men Yes, black men as well as white men will be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it is obvious today that America has defaulted on its promissory note in so far as its citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. No, we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash a check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time rise from the dark, desolate valleys of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. Oh, I say to you today, my friend, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, Sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners one day be able to sit down together at the table of justice. I have a dream. One day, state of Mississippi, state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day my four little children one day be able to live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, 
but by the content of their character, I have a dream today. I have a dream that down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls one day be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that every valley will be exalted. Every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when we can sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America's to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the highland Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring. From the curvaceous slopes of California, not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. God bless you. Hey. 
enjoyed that song and so delighted to be here. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Randy. We watch his teaching and his preaching weekly, and I'm just very honored to stand in his spot. Thank you, Pastor Adrian, 
and the entire pastoral team for great leadership in facilitating our worship experience today. Following this freedom motif, I'm feeling the need to direct our attention now to the book of John, the eighth chapter and the 36th verse. It states there clearly and succinctly, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That text is probably best illustrated by the Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. As I preach on the subject unshackled today, I want to showcase it through Mark 5 in the context of the theme of John 8, 36. Mark chapter 5 and verse 1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. <clears throat> who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For Jesus saith unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And verse 15 declares, And they come to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting, and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Father, be with this word today in Jesus' name. Amen. In this, the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, as well as John 8.36, I find that perhaps you do as well, what must be one of the most interesting chapters in the entire Word of God. Now, there's another chapter like it in the Bible. For in Mark 5, the writer articulately conveys what it's like to lose your mind, what it's like to be trapped and enshrouded by circumstances that you cannot manage nor contain. But it also talks about the dynamic, liberating, and emancipating power of Jesus Christ. So thus, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we who are endeavoring to follow in the footprints of the God-man Jesus Christ, we find ourselves living in very hostile environments. Would you agree? really in a very perilous period of history. Wolf Blitzer puts it this way. We're living in an age of crises, conflicts, and confrontations. We're living in an age where goodness has been gored by the bull of iniquity. We're living in an age where holiness is hated. Truth has been trampled underneath the insensitive feet of men and women in an age where Christ is cheerfully crucified. His presence is not welcome, nor is it wanted. I've got to add, though, that this is not peculiar nor unique to the 21st century. For if I read my Bible right and understand it correctly, this has always been the case. Christ has always been hated by many. He's often been alienated and ostracized and excommunicated from society. Such is the case in this story, this account of this demoniac of Gadara. You know, Mark focuses on one man, but the other synoptic gospels, they tell the same story and they talk about many demon-possessed men. 
but Mark probably seeking to convey and showcase the magnitude and the enormity of this man's problem, he focuses on one man. Picture the scene in your mind's eye if you can. Jesus has been teaching and preaching by the seaside. And now being physically and emotionally exhausted, he beseeches his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. May I suggest figuratively today on this Sabbath that has been designated as Black History Sabbath, let's cross over to a higher level of commitment to Jesus Christ. Let's cross over to a greater investment along the path of cultural competency and diversity. Let's cross over to a deeper level of piety in the things of God. Let's cross over to the other side. Well. There to meet him on the other side was a land that was considered to be Gentile territory, the land of Gadara. Heavily influenced by the Hellenistic culture, if you please. You see, they knew more about Mount Olympus than they knew of Mount Zion. They knew more about Zeus than they knew of Jehovah. They knew more about the philosophical patterns of Plato than they did of the moral mandates of Moses. But despite this culture, Christ went on anyhow. Why? His divine antenna picked up a distress signal. Somebody was in need. Somebody was entrapped. Somebody was shackled. Somebody was calling on the name of Jesus. Well, there to meet him was a man whose dilemma was serious. He was disowned by his people. He was living in a cemetery, and not the least of his problems, he was possessed with demons. Here he is. I've endeavored to look at this man. His peer group condemns him. He's forced to live in a graveyard, and he's possessed with demons. Tragedy, tragedy is, I understand that graveyards are designed for dead folks, and not the living, but his home is a tomb. His companions are the skeletal fragments of those who sleep in the dust. Somebody has said this man was not only emotionally emulsified and mentally mortified, but he was also spiritually strangulized. He was dead, a spiritually dead demoniac. And it highlights the fact, my brothers and my sisters, that either we're going to be directed by God or driven by the devil. Either we're going to be influenced by Jesus or infested by the devil. Either we're going to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit or desecrated by an evil spirit. There is no middle ground of neutrality. There's no straddling the fence when it comes to spiritual things. I wonder, what is it that caused this man to live in such a condition? Like many of us, was it that he couldn't cope? with the problems that he faced? Or perhaps he just couldn't bear his burdens in the heat of the day. Or perhaps he just couldn't stand up under the pressures, the pressures of staying in school, the pressures of finding suitable employment, the pressures of being a social outcast in society, the pressures of seeing the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, or perhaps his sins had pushed him further and further to a point of no extrication. I don't know what the issues really were, but Ellen White makes an observation, my favorite author. She says, this man was leading a normal life like many of us. One day he took a step and the devil took control of his mind. Somebody has said, the world could see the scars on the outside of this man, but nobody could see the wounds on the inside. Here he is, he lives in a cemetery. Let me suggest something. Spiritually, whenever a person turns his or her back on God, there's but one place for that person to live, and that's in the tombs of iniquity. Hear me, it matters not how intelligent you might think you are. You may have been on the dean's list every semester in college. I'm not against education. It matters not how many degrees you've got behind your name. But without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. 
You may dress in all the finest of clothes and all the designer labels, but without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. Your home might look like the Taj Mahal, but without Jesus, you're living amongst the tombs. There's but one place for a man or a woman who retreats from God and reality, and that's in the tombs of iniquity, the tombstones of irrationality. I can imagine they hadn't buried anyone in that part of the cemetery for quite a long while. Anyone who walked by automatically quickened their footsteps. Must have been some mischievous kids, you know, some bad kids, I don't know, from the hood maybe, I don't know, who would take rocks and throw at that man and, and taunt him and say, hey, crazy man, and I could hear the sound of alarm that would be given as mothers would gather up their kids like hens gathering their food, and strong men in masses would pounce upon that man and bind him once again after he's broken out with leather straps and iron chains, throwing him back into the cemetery. You know, sin is just like that. The Bible says the wicked in Isaiah are like the troubled sea, which cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You must not live where I live. I, I'm from New York. I currently live in Atlanta. I lived in LA before I went back home. Friday nights, the clubs are packed, running from man to man, from woman to woman, sucking on the bottle, popping pills. You see, we have a message to share for people who are searching for peace, Dr. Palmer, Peace doesn't come in a bottle, but it comes in the body of Christ. Peace doesn't come in a pill, but it comes in a person. Peace doesn't come in a sexual encounter, but it comes in a savior. And his name is Jesus. Mark says this man is so frustrated with himself, he's so angry, he's so hurt, he's so done with life, he's so abused, he's so, un he's so shackled, he's so enshrouded, he's so trapped, he's so hurt that he hurts himself further. He takes sharp rocks and he lacerates his flesh and, and he pulls his hair out by the roots and he gouges his eyes and oh, he's hurting himself. And that's kind of how culture is. We, all on our way to church, on our way from church, we pass a whole lot of people who are hurting themselves. Doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're a part of. You pass people who are, who are, who are beat out and done out and done with life and tired of being tired. They succeed in hurting themselves. And you want to know what that looks like? Ask the young man who's overdosed with a crack pipe or a needle stuck in his arm. If he could, he'd tell you. He's only succeeded in hurting himself. Ask the brother whose liver is bloated, whose heart is failing. If he's clear because of alcohol at the end of the day, he will tell you he's only succeeded in hurting himself. Ask the woman who walks the streets by night selling her wares to feed her children. If she's clear and honest and forthright, she will tell you she's only succeeded in hurting herself. Ask the woman. Ask the guy who may have quietly delved into immorality. Nobody knows but them and God. They had fun, but at the end of the day, when it's all over, when the party subsides, if they're clear, they will tell you they've only succeeded in hurting themselves. But what is this man really asking? As he howls, as he moans, as he lacerates his flesh, as he cries and he moans all night long. Late in the evening, you could hear him crying loudly. Early in the morning, you could hear him whimpering softly. He's just hurting himself. What is he really asking? He's asking culture. Does anybody care? Is anybody interested in what I'm going through? Has anybody taken any subtle observation of my circumstances? Does anybody care? You know, teenage suicide is higher now at the end of 2021. This is hot off the press, off the sociological press, than it's ever been before. More young people are taking their lives now than they ever have before. And they're taking their lives in protest. They're wondering, does anybody care? And the church, and this is a beautiful building, but I'm not talking about the brick and the mortar. I'm talking about you and me. We've got to give an answer. We've got to go out where the rubber meets the road. We got to find that junkie, that druggie, and offer him a new high in Jesus Christ. We got to find that drunk and offer him a drink that won't make him drunk, 
but he'll be drinking from the crystal fountain that shall never run dry. Does anybody care? I can see Jesus now as he's making his way across the lake. And that divine antenna picks up the signal of that SOS, of that crying trap man. Yes, there's somebody who cares about you. Jesus is his name. Help is on the way. I love Desire of Ages. It paints the picture so beautifully. Ellen G. White says, you know, darkness has a way of making dark places look strange. For out of the elongated shadows of night, she says, suddenly out of the tombs, as Jesus and the disciples are getting there, this eerie form appears, and he lets loose with the shriek that seemed to come from the very pits of hell itself. As they look at the man, he's stark naked. He's foaming at the mouth. His eyes look like two coals of fire from the burning hell itself. He's screaming and hollering. He's jumping up and down, and the disciples take one look at him, and their blood runs cold and curdles within their veins, and they leave Jesus standing there all by himself. Oh, church of the living God, how easily we forget how the Lord has helped us through and out of our last crises. Why, you know the story of Mark 4, just coming over the lake the night before. The winds and the waves became a little unruly. And the lightning had begun to write a, a flaming message of descent in the sky. And the thunder was muttering in protest against the eastern horizon. And everybody on board was afraid. Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know the story. Jesus stood up and told the winds to shut up and the waves to be still. That same hand that calmed the storm. The same hand that quieted the elements. The same hand that stemmed the tide was held up against these raging demons and this one man. And the Bible is clear through the spirit of prophecy as well that these demons were raging, but they were helpless. You know what that tells me? All hell can break loose in your life come Monday morning. But as long as your hand is in God's hand, the demons of hell, they might be raging, but they'll be helpless. Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. You know, these, these demons, as they looked at Jesus, they had a sense of recall. You know, I was sharing with my group this morning, you know, once you've been whipped, you never forget it. I'm gonna ask you a rhetorical question that means do not answer out loud, but let me ask you. Don't tell on yourself. Have you ever been beaten up before? Don't answer. I can tell you I have. It was embarrassing, it was humiliating. I was in the seventh grade, middle school, sitting next to a little Asian fellow. He was smart, he got A's on his exams. Don't worry about them PhDs and stuff they say I have. I got D's on my exams. Oh, I was a ball player. I played ball. I was a young athlete in middle school. And I recall, ladies and gentlemen, I just didn't like this Asian fella. He had, he had long hair, and I had kinky hair. He had slanted eyes. I didn't like them slanted eyes. He got A's on his exam. I got D's. I didn't like him. So I took my pencil eraser, and I started poking him in his side just to be aggravated. And he says, ouch, that hurts. Please stop. I said, no, I don't want to stop. <laughs> Teacher was writing on the board, and he stopped writing, and he turned around and said, Ronald, pick up your pencil and keep your hands to yourself and leave Choi alone. Get your work done. He turned back around. As soon as he turned around, I looked at Choi, and I started again. And this time I turned it around. I started poking him with the point. And he said, ouch, <laughs> let's not do that. Let's be friends. I want to be your friend. I said, I don't want to be friends. <laughs> and then he gave a plaintive wail. He says, I don't want to fight. I said, I want to fight. <laughs> I was taller than he was. He was a little short fella, and I was a little tall. Believe it or not, I had muscles. <laughs> don't be looking at me like that. I had muscles, okay? And basically, I was a taller than this fella. I could beat him. I could take him, so I just knew I had him. Well, the bell rang, you know, at 3 o'clock, 3.30, there was always a special feature at the flagpole in the front courtyard of the school. Well, the special feature that day was for Choi and myself. Now, this is before social media. 
I don't know how the word got around. There were no texting, Instagram. There was nothing. Somehow the word got around and the crowds were there. It was like the WWF. <laughs> they were waiting. I got to that flagpole. Choi's trying to get away. I said, come back here, Choi. He's trying to get away. And I'm pushing him. He says, stop. Let's be friends. I said, I don't want to be friends. Come here, boy. And I said, put up your dudes. Let's go at it. And I lunged at him. And the last thing I remember, <laughs> I saw something like this. And he kicked me down to the concrete. My head hit that cold ground. And when it hit the ground, I looked up and the heavens opened. And I saw the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and all the heavenly constellations. Well, I'm not going down like that. There was a hush over the crowd. They couldn't believe it. This bully Ron Smith getting beaten down by little Choi like this. Oh, I couldn't go down like that. So I jumped up again, and I lunged at him, and again he says, ha! Kicked me back down to the earth, my head hit that ground, then I saw some of the most beautiful colors. <laughs> and then, in that moment, with my back on the ground and my head swirling, seeing beautiful constellations and colors, I began to pray. <laughs> you know what my prayer was? Lord, please end this fight. <laughs> no, folk, don't laugh at me now. That's a good prayer. Say that's a good prayer. That's a good prayer. When you're in trouble, even when you started your own mess, you can still pray. Well, I prayed. Lord, get me out of this. This is embarrassing. People are watching. There are a couple of young ladies in that crowd that I like. You know, I want to be a muscle bound. I didn't want them to see me getting beaten down like that. That was humiliating. humiliating. Pastor Adrian, I couldn't stand that humiliation. And there I lay. And I prayed. But my, that's a good prayer I prayed. Lord, get me out of this mess. But then my prayer twisted and it got a little jiggy. Then I said, Lord, just like you were with David when he killed David the shepherd boy, when he killed the lion with his bare hands. Lord, just like you were with Samson when he killed 10,000 Philistines. Be with me this last time, dear Jesus, as I take this Asian out in your name. <laughs> what an ignorant prayer. Aren't you glad God doesn't answer every prayer we pray? But you know, the Lord really answered the prayer because I, of course, um, I jumped up again with newfound strength and I, I lunged at him again. And this time he was swirling around like a top. Kind of reminded me of somebody named Bruce Lee. And he was making all of these noise and his body was doing all of these gyrations. And it's like he was flying almost. His hair was all over his head and he was saying, oh, 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 oh. And I lunged at him again, he kicked me again. This time his foot caught me in the head and it kicked me against the flagpole and then my head hit the ground. I remember saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> Blood pouring out of my nose and mouth. And then he took his little handkerchief and he leaned down, he says, Ron, are you okay? <laughs> And he picked me up, walked me to the washroom, wiped the blood off my collar. Of course, the young ladies that I thought liked me, they kind of walked away pitifully, you know, and you know, left me as a little pitiful specimen there. And basically, I went to the bathroom and got cleaned up, came out. The crowd was still there. I was hoping they'd be gone. They were still there. And then I put my arm around his shoulders, and I said, man, we ought to be friends. We ought to hook up. <laughs> Do you realize I prayed and the Lord answered the prayer? Many years later, many years later, 22 years ago from now. You see, I'm really, I'm, I'm an old man now. I'm just old with dye in my head, that's all. I'm trying to look young. I'm trying to look young. This is just dye, I'm as old as dirt, okay. But 22 years ago, 22 years ago, I, I suffered a stroke and I was crippled by the stroke. Doctors said I would never walk again. There were a team of doctors in a teaching university hospital in New York City, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. And there I lay, with a team of doctors around. One doctor on his smock, he had a little thing, said, uh, Dr. Choi. <laughs> and he walked, he says, hey, Ron, remember me? <laughs> My first instinct was, dear God, no, okay? <laughs> and so I said, somehow I just don't have a recollection. I don't have a recall. I recalled, I don't have a recall. He says, I'll cut it out, knock it off, Ron. He says, let me ask you, do you still have that left hook? 
I said, no, Doc Joy. I said, I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. He says, we're going to get you up. We're going to get you out of the... The, the guy is my friend to this very day. He stuck with me. He helped me, even when he wasn't my physician. But more importantly, the moral of this story is I had a sense of recall. These demons in human flesh, they recognize this is the same being, meaning Jesus, who kicked them out of heaven in the first place. And if demons recognize who Jesus is, then everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Come out of the man by one clean spirit. Well, approximately 2,000 demons ran into 2,000 pigs. The pigs committed suicide, ran violently down a steep place into the sea, the text says, and were choked in the sea. That's another way of saying that the NASDAQ fell. <laughs> the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached an all-time low. Because the Bible says those that fed the swine, they came out to see what happened to the economy, to see what happened, to see what it was that was done. But what did they see? They saw a man sitting and clothed and in his right mind. He's not screaming and hollering now, but there he sits with the docility of a little child. There he sits with the innocence of a little baby. There he sits in all gentleness. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now Jesus is about to leave because the folk want to kill him because he killed the economy. Master, can I go with you? The man says, Jesus says, no, sir. Why? I need you to go back to your neighborhood. Go back to your church. Go back to the place where you had influence in times past. Go back and show yourself to the people. Show them the great things I've done for you. Show them how you were shackled and how I unshackled you. Can you see him? as he's escorted down the dusty roads of downtown Loma Linda. I'm sorry, downtown Decapolis. <laughs> People are asking, what happened to you? He says, I don't know. All I know is I met a man named Jesus. Yeah. What does that mean? It means I gave him my sorrows and he gave me his joys. I gave him my nightmares and he gave me his dreams. I gave him my life and he made me a brand new creature. All I can say is that I'm free. A question for us today, would you be free from your burdens, whatever they are? Guess what? There's power in the blood of Jesus. How do I know? They took him one day. They strung him up. They took him down. They put him in a tomb. They put guards on the outside and a stone at the door, but he kicked free. And because he's free, I'm free. And because he's loose, I'm loose. And because he's got power, I've got power. I don't know what situation you find yourself in today. The doctor might declare that you will never get well. The diagnosis might be that you will never ever see again. The divorce might be final. The house might foreclose. And it's under those circumstances that you honestly begin to wonder, does God love me? Does God care? Is he going to leave me in this trapped condition? Is he going to unshackle me? Does God really care? I'm here to say in closing, oh yes, he cares. And his heart is touched by your entrapped conditions. I see him right now. I see him as I'm talking to you. I see him, the great God of the universe at creation. He doesn't need to get his hands dirty. He doesn't need to stoop by an unnamed stream. He's already proven what he could do. When he claps his hands, there's light. When he calls, the trees jump forth. At the will of his mind, the birds of the air and the beasts suddenly appear. But for you and for me, he stooped. Divine knees got dirty. I gotta leave you with Jesus now. What is he? Just a neurologist when you've had a stroke? Just a cardiologist if you've got a bad heart? What is he? Is he just a good passenger when you've got a sinking boat? Is he just a grocer when you've got some hungry folk? I'm glad he's all of that. But thank God he's more. When you don't have a job, he's the best employment agent in the universe. When you mess up your reputation and people don't trust you anymore and you try to come back to church, he's a robe to cover your shame. He's Adam's redeemed. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's hope. He's Jeremiah's bones of fire. He's Amos's justice. He's Hosea's love. He's Micah's mercy. He's Esther's determination. He's my bread when I'm hungry. He's my water 
when I'm thirsty. When I get down to my last dime, he steps right in on time. Somebody has said, he's my sacrifice. He's my priest pleading for my atonement. He's my Shekinah that lights the dark way. He's the veil through which I reach God. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Savior for any sinner who wants salvation. He's intercessor supreme. He's mediator, redeemer, restorer. He's the only one in our trapped conditions who can unshackle us. Oh, I love him today. Do you love him today? God bless you. Let the church say amen. amen. We want to thank you, Dr. Smith, for inspiring us today with this wonderful message. Thank you, Brother David, so much as well, and to the Kansas Avenue Praise Team. We thank all of you for your wonderful contribution to our church service today, and we just ask that the Spirit of God will go with each of you as you move forth. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we have been challenged today to turn our lives over to you anew to turn our situations over to you, the only true God who can handle any situation that we face today. We thank you for the message that we have heard that reminds us, Father, that you love us so much that you stooped down and you came here to be with us. And that you love us so much, Father, that you promised to come and take us home to live with you. But let us take the challenge of this message today to go out and reach out to some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, who is in need of a touch, in need of compassion, Father. Let us be that agent of compassion today. This is our prayer. In the blessed name of our best friend, Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen.
Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath to all of you out there. Sheila and I here together. We're going to give you a quick tour of our new facility, but we're standing here in a special place. Uh, uh, Sheila, what we're standing in front of right now? Well, we're excited to show this whole place to you. We're standing in front of the studio that we've been working in for 15 years. It's had a lot of different renovations, but um, we're just right in, would you say in front? Yeah. We're on the side of it, sort of like. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like on the side. Wonderful. And, and just on the precipice of the new exciting building that you have blessed us with your gifts, that um, with God's help, this has been created. Amen. Amen. So we're going to show you this, pro this project as a testimony of what God has done here for LLVM. But before we go any further, we're going to have verse of the day. Sheila, you have it? I do. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's correct, Sheila. Uh, that was a great verse. As a matter of fact, this verse reflects the very essence of topics we're discussed into Christian connections that we recorded last week. Your last chance to tune into it this evening at the scheduled time you see at the bottom of the screen. You know, faith is what built LLVN. Faith is what brought us all together here, Sheila. Faith, what helped us develop this place behind us, because we never had the money when we bought the property. Mm -hmm. We borrowed and we fixed it, we paid it off, and we've been debt-free since. And it was faith that we stepped out in to build this building in, because we thought we had all the money to start, but soon before the beginning, we realized that money was not going to cover all expenses because of COVID-19, increased cost of material that jumped up by 30, 40 percent, in some cases 100 percent. So we knew by faith we have to continue. And through faith, God helped LLVN have a new facility here for His Amen. own glory. Yes, that's so exciting. I'm excited to show it to our viewers. Yeah, you know, we all are because they're the ones who deserve to see it. Since yes. They you were our partner throughout the whole process and you helped to shape our faith by your support and your involvement with us because it made us know that there are partners like you out there who believe in what we're doing. Well, uh, we have sponsors today for the live broadcast. I mean, we, we have sponsors all throughout the week, but we always try to pick up, focus on the four who we picked for the live broadcast. So who do you have for us? We have the Fendel family from Maryland the Wichinich family from California, the Bone family from Oregon, and the Trey family from Georgia. I hope I didn't mess up your names, but please forgive me. And you could write in and let me know um, how to pronounce it next time. And special thanks to all of you folks, those who Sheila just mentioned, and yes. all of you who are sponsoring us throughout the week 24-7. Well, we do want to invite you to go to our website. There is continued growth on our website. Uh, uh, we just added the uh, uh, Romanian channel archives. It's kind of getting started there. So now there's nine channels on our website that you can get access to, although the Romanian channel is still under development, but now you can get a sneak preview mm. of what we have there. It's really exciting what Jesus is leading us with this ministry. So go to our website, LLBN.tv. Download your phone app. If you have Apple or Android, they can go what? To the, to the App Store? They can. And just um, download LLBN TV. Yeah. No, not even TV. Just, just LLBN. LLBN. Okay. Yeah, Four that's letters. Right. All you and have has to do is a a white dove. That's it's really right. great. And, and, and you can enjoy LLBN nine channels from wherever you're at. You can be driving and listening, mm -hmm. or you could be at home watching, or you could be at the office listening as well so that's right and God, i just told my sister just to download it she kept you. asking me what channel is that i go just get the app you could see it on your phone you know, everyone so. i meet i introduce my name and say do me a favor go to your phone download the app <laughs> yeah and then i'll continue the conversation and now you'd be surprised how many friends i've built this is how we expand the ministry by you telling friends and a friend tells yes. another friend it's yes. really exciting isn't it's it? it's great because wherever you are you can watch it you can have church wherever you go i mean I believe it's not just one day that you talk to God. It's 
we live and he, he has our being, you know? Right. So it's like we breathe it. And the more we do that, it just becomes more of who we are. Amen, amen. Well, why don't we pause here and have you read some of our lucky letter writings. Okay, or sounds good, sounds good. We have letters from Dan from Seattle, Washington, who writes, Thank you all for what you do. LLBN is such a blessing. And Monica from Grand Terrace, California, says, I'm 85, and I love the Sabbath church service each Friday night. It's a blessing to have church on TV. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Monica. Should we pray for them now? Absolutely. Go ahead. Dan um, and Monica, dear God, we just present them to you. We lift them up in prayer. We thank you so much for their dedication and their love and prayers and the support for LBN. It's, it's through the love of, and support of all our viewers that this is done, but most especially it's because you bless us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, and um, we ask you to continue to be with us and especially be with our viewers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So from locally at Grand Terrace to Washington to around the world, if you're watching, praise God. He has helped us build this new facility. We started from cleaning up dirt, mm -hmm. paving the ground, and to where it's at now, right now. It is all for His glory, and we're going to give you a quick tour of what we have to show you today. Should we do it? Yes, let's go. Well, we just changed position, and I'm going to quiz Sheila, see how she, would de how she would describe what we're standing. Well, I would call this the hub that connects to everything. Like we have the old studio, and we have all the new things that we are going to explore together. So, Ganem, you could tell more about that. I'm impressed, <laughs> and it connects us to the upstairs wing, uh, south and north wings. Uh, this is truly the hub, the center connection, tying new and old and upstairs resources all in one. But we're going to take you right now to one of our video control rooms. So why don't we take you and show you what we have there? Well, now we're taking you in a very, very important room of our operation. And let's see if Sheila knows what this room is. Well, I just can see it says we are in some type of control room, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. You're absolutely right. You mean, you, you're a broadcaster now. You, you seem to... Well, this is very high tech. I'm very, you know, I'm learning as our viewers. I'm learning with you viewers. So. Well, that, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. We're all growing together. This room is not completely furnished with all the complex electronics yet. But as you see, the room is ready. The monitor's hung. There's other layer of monitors. Cables will be hidden. And there's equipment cabinets directly across mm -hmm. from us that will be populated with very high cost broadcast equipment. Uh, but this room essentially can direct programs from any of our six different studio locations. So it's a very, very essential room to our operation. It's but there kind are of other, like the brains of yeah, everything. Yeah, it's like central mm -hmm. command center for mm -hmm. lack of better words. But we have other technology room are equally important to this room. We're gonna take you there next. So this is one of the other rooms. We clearly cannot show every room because several of them are just still empty. But Sheila, since you know so much about our development, what is this room? Well, this is the data processing room. So it's really exciting, Dean Ganem. I can't tell you. I'm really excited about looking at all of this and just seeing the fruition from literally dirt to this wonderful building. See what God can do. So amazing. It's amazing, and which is why you want to tune in to Christian Connections this evening because it talks about faith. It's a great program. And this whole building, again, built by faith. We have Jessica Paley here. You want to say, wave your hands to the cameras. Hi, Jessica. Uh, this room has been tested with the computer terminals surrounding the room. And that's where we do all the data processing for information. Uh, and uh, it's a very critical component of our day-to-day uh, -day operation. But let's continue on to show other Sounds parts good. of the, other parts of the um, our organization. So I'm stepping here in this room. Sheila, why don't you come and join me here in this room and let's face the camera. And folks, this is another very critical room of our operation. There are two like it, but slightly different in, in, in shape and, and type of equipment. But here to my left, there are special electronic equipment rack where we would house very complex broadcast pieces of equipment as well here as we did in the other room. 
But this room has a very special function. We call it Master Control One. Sheila can explain to you what this room is purpose for. Well, basically, if there's something that goes wrong internationally with the feed, mm -hmm. this is the room that can help and control that. And they'll know right away if something breaks the feed. Is Precisely. That Precisely. Okay. That's, that's excellent description. So we have worldwide distributions going from thousands of hubs across the world. And as Sheila said, if any of them go out of service or fail to operate, our staff here will be able to tell that it went down in real time so they can make the proper calls to restore the service. And there will be more monitors, of course, installed on the wall. This is just in its preliminary phase of housing it with equipment. But there's more. We're going to take them upstairs and give them a tour. Are you up to it? Sounds good. So we're here in the middle in a very, very important room. And what is it called? The master video control room number two. That's correct, number two. So this room has a many, many purposes. It's truly really a multi-purpose room. More monitors going on the walls, three layers of small monitors all the way across. Cabinets here with equipment will be housed with very complex technologies to do what? To be able to pull in international feeds and productions from around the world. This room will be able to do five to six mul uh, uh, simultaneous live productions, either from locally or internationally or combined of all that. And this room also where we can do all the live switching between program to program. As you see on Sabbath when University Church airs, we switch back between week review and we put a little music and fillers between. That requires special switching and operation. This room will do that as well. Important room, keep it in mind. In the future, you'll see the result and the work of this room coming your way. Let's go move on to show them the rest. Wow, this is about two-thirds the space of what we just toured. That's correct, that's correct. So this is all drywalled, uh, uh, cleaned, ready to go, electrical distributed throughout the, this place. It's place for growth. Uh, we have other plans, but, you know, we have to make... We had to stop part of this construction to work with the money we had. Uh, this is where we look up to you, our dear partners, to help build this house of worship. It's a virtual house of worship that reaches the entire world with the word of God. So uh, uh, amazing what God has done for mm. us, Sheila. We have suffered during the building. We were hit by COVID. Uh, there's shortage in supply, equipment, and uh, supplies cost more than some cases doubled. Uh, it was hard work, hard labor, but look what we did. It's for the glory of our God. Amen. And your help and support made it possible, but much more needed. Last word, Sheila. That's right. It, it's all the gifts and the prayers that you have contributed. We're all together in this and all praise and glory to God. We want to be and continue to be LLBN, which is Lighting Lives, Blessing Nations. Amen, and may God bless you richly. And please do not forget your prayers for LLVN. We are viewer-supported number. God bless you. Amen. God bless.